Okay. Um, so for our keynote speaker, uh, I'd like to introduce him. His name is Evan Shapiro. He is the CEO of MENA Foundation and a co-founder of MENA Protocol and has been deeply committed to protecting user data privacy for his entire career. It's all we do here at MENA Protocol. It's, it's so, so important, um, as you just found out. Um, please welcome him to the stage. Hello, everyone. Nice, thanks. Okay. Hey, everyone. Let's see. So I think, yeah, you can see the presentations on either side. That's great. Let's, let's do it. So yeah, I'll just be talking about zero knowledge proofs for a little bit. Um, not just Mina. Uh, I think we have a lot of folks in the audience today um, from across lots of projects participating in panels and stuff, so that's really exciting. Um, I think it's just good to start off talking about the state of zero knowledge. It's uh, definitely gotten a lot more interest in the last like year or two. I remember when it was extremely niche. It's still maybe a little bit niche, but increasingly less so. Um, over the last like maybe six or twelve months in particular, I think we would say that it's it's um, gotten a lot more attention and activity, uh, and there's been a lot of momentum in zk research and zk teams building and a uh, number of projects and funding and everything. So I think that is super exciting and uh, something I think we should ask kind of why that is happening. I just wanted to give a high level of that first, and I think really. It's a big part of that is the transition from Web 2 to Web 3. So uh, I think it's maybe useful to zoom out for a second and look at all the different um, stages of the internet over time. Uh, we initially had this Web 1 world that was very user-centric, but pretty limited. Um, people had to run their own servers, uh, mostly static web pages, uh, but very user-centric and user-owned, which was kind of cool. Um, Web 2, uh, we had the advantages of centralized servers bringing together really awesome and powerful user experiences that were very easy for people to use, uh, but with the cost of uh, you know centralizing all of our data, centralizing uh, who has power over these systems. Um, so there's that. And then Web 3 is this opportunity to go back to a more decentralized world, hopefully, I think, with a better user experience. But there's been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, still gaps to fill in um, to make that experience actually as good as Web 2. And I think some of those key um, things that actually are needed are provided by zero knowledge proofs, uh, which, um, you know, kind of lends themselves to some of the rise we're seeing in them now. If you want to build a Web 3 application that has a notion of privacy that doesn't just share all of your data publicly, you need some privacy preserving cryptographic um, primitives. Zero knowledge proofs provide that. And if you want to operate at scale, if you want to do things like high throughput EVM transactions or uh, very large applications with large numbers of users, you need good technology around verifying large amounts of computation, which zero knowledge proofs also provide. So there are these key things that Web3 needs to be able to do to be competitive with Web2. And I think zero knowledge proofs provide a lot of those, which is, I think, why we're starting to see them rise now as, as Web3 gets more traction and why I think we'll continue to see it rise um, over the next few months and years. Uh, I wanted to give a brief overview of zero knowledge proofs as well. Uh, so many of the audience are probably familiar already with, with this, but let's, let's run through it. This is at least uh, you know, affirming on it. So zero knowledge proofs, what are they? Uh, they let you prove and verify information in this private and trustless and decentralized way uh, with two very important properties. For one, uh, they're very efficient to check. I can have you know, a computation that uh, runs on a supercomputer and takes you know, a decade to run or something uh, in, in my, you know, my, my phone time, but it can be very cheap to check on the phone. It's the constant size to um, check these proofs uh, independent of how big the computation is. And additionally, you can hide information in these proofs and say uh, an authority you trust has provided this data or some other conditions are true about this data, but I'm not going to tell you what the actual data is, just that the conditions are meant. So uh, that's super cool, because uh, then that gives us the you know, verification and privacy properties we want. Uh, and this leads to a lot of applications, some of which I think will be familiar here, some of which uh, I think are maybe still, still somewhat new. Uh, ZK rollups and ZK EVMs uh, are, for one, a big one of these private transactions, private voting, uh, things like ZK identity, uh, being able to say, I'm a person, but I'm not going to tell you particularly who I am. 
and efficiently verifiable large computation. I think in particular ZKML is a very exciting use case for this. Uh, being able to verify the output of a neural network is a certain thing given an input uh, without necessarily having the hardware to run that locally yourself. So a lot of, a lot of cool use cases. And I w also wanted to give, uh, this is a more, um, like uh, definitely a technical uh, review of zero knowledge proofs, but I think this is like a useful abstraction if you um, uh, find this way of thinking about it useful. Uh, in the same way a hash function goes from like, you, you can basically manage that zero knowledge proofs is just another cryptographic primitive similar to hash functions or public key signatures. And, and this is what they are on screen. Uh, like this, this is what zero knowledge proofs are. So hash functions, uh, you know, take a string and they give you another string. Uh, you, you Ish. <laughs> public key signatures, uh, you can take a message and you can sign it with a private key, get a signature, and then anyone can verify with a public key that the signature and the message are, you know, as expected, actually signed by the private key. For zero knowledge proofs, what's happening is you can take a program and you can compile that into a verification key. And then you can come along and you can prove that if you run um, a pr the program with respect to some public inputs and some private inputs, the program will, will pass. And then uh, someone else can come along and verify that your proof passes with respect to the public inputs and the verification key um, later on. So it's you know this family of functions that uh, really defines what zero knowledge proofs are if you want to uh, think about them at this level. Okay. We also, uh, I think, are just wrapping up. I think this might actually be the announcement of the results of it, a zero knowledge proof survey uh, for 2023. We did one of these last year as well, uh, and found that people were starting to understand and see what zero knowledge proofs were, but you'll see that like, uh, you know, it's even farther along now. So uh, we, uh, people are much more familiar with zero knowledge proofs increasingly, uh, developers in particular. It's at 90.2% now, which is you know, a very large percentage of developers are familiar with zero knowledge proofs. So very widely understood and known. Uh, a lot of respondents see the need um, for finance to have zero knowledge proofs. I think it's been like a big uh, talking point within crypto, so it makes sense. Uh, and also people feel like zero knowledge proofs are more essential to bridging the gap between Web 2 and Web 3, with a third actually believing it's of the highest importance. So pretty cool. I think people are really starting to wrap their heads around zero knowledge proofs in a, in a you know, very like kind of, you know, 90% is like, that's like, this is like a very general survey of people in the industry. So it's awesome to see this kind of happening. People are getting the importance of zero knowledge proofs, which is super cool. Uh, there's a full report available. I mean, protocol.com, there's a lot more information there about many different statistics besides the one I've mentioned, if you, if you want to check it out. I wanted to also just give a quick update on the latest on Mina. Uh, for people that don't know, uh, Mina is a layer one built on zero knowledge proofs. So uh, this means it both has this smart contract layer, ZK apps, where you can um, program using zero knowledge proofs uh, using TypeScript in this very kind of clean way. And also uh, the entire blockchain is uh, itself a zero knowledge proof. So it's very efficient to verify and very interoperable, uh, which is another cool property. And between these, it's a very good blockchain to be building um, zero knowledge proofs on and, and programming zero knowledge proofs on with. Uh, ZK apps, uh, like I mentioned, smart contract language. Uh, what's very cool is it's written in TypeScript, uh, so you, it's just TypeScript. You just do like you know npm install snarky.js, and and you can well really ZK app dash CLI, but whatever. <laughs> and then uh, you can uh, can write your knowledge proof applications. Um, it has you know user privacy, scalable verification as like you know key features, of course. Uh, it also has full support for recursion and uh, composability of smart contracts. Uh, the underlying proof system. Uh, is, has really good support for things like that, uh, unlike some other ones. So it, it's useful if you're trying to do recursion stuff in particular. Um, it's also the underlying proof system is uh, you know open source, of course, and uh, there's no trustless setup. There's no trusted setup or anything. So there's, there's things like that that are cool. Uh, I, I mentioned Mina is easy to verify. The entire the the idea for Mina is that each time you make a block, you're recursively verifying the previous block, as well as the state transition to the new block which gives you kind of like an inductive recursive proof all the way back to the genesis, uh, which means that uh, you can verify the whole thing in a few kilobytes. Uh, this is both good if you want to run the, uh, you know, Mina on like a phone. You can actually fully verify and run a full node on your, on your you know, browser or your just device, as well as uh, we can get really uh, secure ZK bridging uh, between, between the two chains. 
Um, like MENA and Ethereum, for example, we can actually run uh, a MENA full node inside of an EVM contract. Uh, so you can uh, write code on MENA that gets then fully verified on Ethereum or other chains. So some cool interoperability stuff as well. I think we'll have more on that uh, later today as well as uh, I think some of us will be at a, a NIL who's been working on a MENA to Ethereum bridge tomorrow at their event. Uh, we also just announced a roadmap, uh, which I think is pretty cool. It has like a few tracks, uh, trust minimization, ZK programmability, settlement layer performance, uh, Muniverse, and which is like a roll-up layer, and uh, road to DAOification. Uh, this is like a multi-year, like, you know, multi-multi-year uh, roadmap. So if you're curious about some like thoughts from the ecosystem on the very long-term direction of a layer one blockchain like Mina, check it out. It has lots of, uh, you know, you can, you can hover over things and read descriptions of individual items and stuff. I think it's uh, cool and, and shows like a, you know, a very kind of complete long-term vision for a project like, like Mina. Uh, yeah, it's interactive, like I mentioned. So you can, you can mess around things and I think it's fun to, fun to navigate. Okay. Uh, there's also been, uh, we recently finished a program called ZK Ignite, um, which is people building projects on Mina with zero knowledge proofs. Just to mention a few of those, uh, there's a project building a layer two solution on, on Mina. Uh, you can build uh, pretty easily recursive rollups uh, using the technology. So you can build uh, scalable L2s pretty, pretty easily. You don't have to like, you know, redo all the cryptography. You can just leverage recursive rollups to, to build something like this. So that's super awesome. Uh, we have someone building a keyless wallet. Uh, so you know, that, that'll be really useful for users in the space. Uh, we have uh, someone who is in the biotech field working on a uh, solution for um, privacy in biomedical data. And there's many more projects uh, that came out of this program. Um, so you know, shout out to anyone who's here working on any of these. Uh, it's cool to see like this first wave of zero knowledge proof applications to getting to start, starting to get built. Uh, very exciting. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're running... Um, about one cohort per quarter. There's going to be another one starting on May 24th. Uh, the you know projects that get chosen, I think there were like 26 in the previous one, uh, get funded and they get support and uh, they also get to you know interact with like a large community of other people building zero knowledge proof applications. So pretty cool if you want to check that out. Um, and that just brings me to an overview of today's event. We have uh, you know talks and panels on privacy, scalability, zk programmability. ZK use cases, ZK adoption, and regulation. So, should be really interesting uh, to you know hearing about all these topics. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from all the panelists. And also, thanks to everyone participating today in this event. Uh, you know, excited to have everyone here and be able to talk about zero knowledge proofs together. Uh, I'm really excited for the conversations today. And I believe that's it, right? We're move and um, I don't know how I did in time, but we'll move into the first panel, or we'll have a minute, I guess, depending. So I can hand this off to Kate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, as you can see on the screen, our next session is a panel on privacy by design, moderated by Nick Sadoff. Did I pronounce that correctly? Um, CTO at Struck Crypto. Nick, welcome to the stage. We'll let you introduce uh, your fellow panelists. So why don't why don't why doesn't everyone maybe starting with Kenny give like a brief introduction to like uh, what what is your project and we can get started from there. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, happy to go first. Hi everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, really excited to be here. I'm Kenny. I'm one of the co-founders of a project called Manta Network and. Um, we are specifically building um, on-chain privacy using zero-knowledge proofs, um, and we are um, focused on on-chain identity. Um, I am, well, I guess a little bit about myself. I actually was the teaching assistant for everyone's favorite person in this room, Gary Gensler, uh, while I was <laughs> over at um, <laughs> MIT. And um, prior to that, I was, uh, in the cloud computing space, uh, running an infrastructure project, and that's kind of how I got into crypto uh, through mining with all the servers that I had. Um, but yeah, so now I'm in privacy. Well, we're off to a great start. <laughs> um, I'm Anastasia, and I did my graduate thesis on um, in information security and privacy, specifically on 
of writing Cambridge Analytica in the, meta, in the metaverse, and so my uh, focus was on identifying the primitives that give rise to surveillance capitalism um, so that we can architect something that makes that business model no longer commercially viable. Um, and my uh, focus is uh, to spark conversations and build trust among people who are either funding or operating um, what I call agentic technologies, mostly decentralized actors, um, building trust in that network so that we have a chance as a decentralized community to um, subvert some of the efforts from centralized um, areas um, to architect technological designs that sort of don't lead to human agency and, in fact, lead to a lot of human suffering. So I do that at um, a discourse club called Agency. Um, there's a reason you haven't heard of it. It's because it's off the record. Uh, but we will be releasing a podcast uh, very soon. Thanks. Uh, yeah, hey, everybody. Um, first, uh, thanks to the MENA team for hosting us. Uh, happy to be here. I'm uh, Alan, one of the co-founders of the Railgun Privacy Project. Uh, most people in the DAO call me the janitor. Um, I do everything that's not development um, seeming uh, on the core team. Um, my background's in finance, so I think I'm trying to figure out if I'm the least technical person here on this panel. Uh, probably am. Um, my background is in uh, offshoring money, so I guess my character arc was uh, hiding money uh, offshore. Now I'm hiding it on chain. <laughs> most technical in finance. <laughs> Uh, hey everyone, I'm Rohan. Uh, I'm a developer at Ironfish. Uh, We're a layer one proof of work company which focuses on private transactions. Uh, we also support, uh, support shielded assets. Uh, before this, I've been a software engineer for around like five or six years. My background has been in embedded systems and I slowly worked my way from a hedge fund to a startup to crypto. So thank you all for having me here. Excited to talk about privacy. And I'm your moderator, so uh, I'm CTO at Struck Crypto. We're a VC firm that's been investing in blockchain since 2017 with 100 million in AUM. Some of our notable investments are um, uh, Shardium, which is a recent investment. Then there's uh, um, One Inch, there's Algorand, there's uh, Hedera Hashgraph, uh, Mythical Games, and uh, Zero Hash. Um, and prior to this, I was working as a lead engineer at Stellar Development Foundation, which is the company behind the XLM token and the Stellar network for about five years. Um, and I worked on a bunch of things like, um, uh, like trading bots, uh, payment channels, uh, bridges, data infrastructure, and uh, like ecosystem proposals, and a whole host of different things. So with that, um, why don't we get started on the panel and first kind of uh, define, like the name of the, this conversation is privacy by design, but let's talk about what is privacy. So does anyone on the panel want to take the first shot of that? Sure, I'll go. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the hot take about privacy is that there is not actually a definition of privacy. It's highly contextual and it changes depending on where you find yourself situationally. Um, that's actually also why it's been difficult to adjudicate privacy or come up with a way to protect it. Um, because in law, you need something that is very specific you can point to, you need to be able to, be able to establish standing, for example, as well. Um, and it's very difficult to establish standing in privacy because privacy harms don't happen at the time when your privacy in, digital, in digital spaces is violated. They accumulate over time, and you kind of don't realize um, what's happened years down the line that now you're being influenced in some way. So because it's difficult to establish standing, it's really hard to adjudicate in law. Because it's really hard to establish harm, it's really hard to take it to a, a, the kind of court that adjudicates torts specifically. And tort law in privacy is about a century old. Um, and it deals with things like intrusion on seclusion, and um, meaning you're in your home, and so um, that's my seclusion, or you've intruded, so now you're, you've harmed me, or like taking your likeness. But none of these things are very, very um, specific to digital spaces, and so the actual law itself is very outdated. Um, so there's no real definition, and there's no way to, to really adjudicate it because of that, because privacy is contextual. Your expectations of privacy are different depending on whether you're at a doctor's office, where you might want to more fluidly share information about yourself, versus some government office where you want to be a little bit more circumspect about what aspects of yourself you share. So there's not really a definition. Um, yeah, sure, just to kind of build on Anastasia and your sort of 
uh, analogy with the doctor's office. I think privacy is very much your ability to um, control and uh, respect your boundaries, physical, digital, whatever it may be, right? And I think like the, the most apparent form of privacy in this room is everyone's clothing, right? <laughs> like, you know, whether I have, um, you know, abs under this or a belly under this, you don't know, right? But you don't have to know in order to, you know, respect what I'm saying. Um, and so that form of control, right, how you perceive others and how you let others perceive you and what information you reveal and don't reveal, I think that is, you know, a, a fundamental aspect of what we refer to when we say privacy. Thank you. And now, can we talk a bit about what does it mean to have privacy by design? Like, how do you design privacy? Um, yeah, I guess I could start with this. So, um, I think if I were to follow up on what Anastasia started with, I think it can be contextual. But for the most part, I think it's um, when you're building a system, privacy is baked into every aspect of the system inherently. So if you're building like a developer product, it could be from storage to networking to communication. Um, but I think the differentiating factor is whether it offloads um, whether the user is, is responsible for the privacy and whether they need to control it. If the system is inherently responsible for it, uh, the user doesn't really need to worry about it. And I think that's one of the qualities that demonstrates if a system is private by design. Right. In other words, like, do I have to be conscious of like whether something's private? And, exactly. Know, if the system's handling that for me. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I can relate to that. You know, so in Railgun, a lot of the things that we do, um, we make sure that we we look at like who has access to the data um, and try to restrict that very strictly to um, the the client, right? So whoever is taking and executing that, whether it's the yeah, so for example, on your phone, if you're generating snark proof, if you're communicating with an RPC, making sure it's proxied, um, it's a it's a very multifaceted and difficult problem. You know, you yeah. have to constantly think about like where are the vectors for like uh, data leak and how do you like prevent that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then, how would you say like how does privacy relate to security? Yeah, I mean, I think you talked about like um, information security, right? I think it's really important. You know. Um, when it comes to financial data, um, you know, you have a certain level of like personal security associated with people not knowing how much money you have, right? So for example, whenever um, the, we talked about the last thing we bought, right? The um, uh, last thing I did is I swiped my credit card at Starbucks and bought a coffee. And the only thing that the barista saw was approved. And they handed me my coffee and I went about my business, right? But they didn't get to learn uh, whether I rent my house or if I have a mortgage and how much that is, how much I spend on dog food and diapers and this sort of thing, right? Um, and so I think in that regard, it's definitely um, you know an element of personal security, right, when it comes to financial data. I just want to make sure that we are clear that privacy security is very different from information security. They are related, but they are very distinct disciplines. Um, in information security concerns itself with securing data at rest or on the move. Um, data is treated as objects, um, and the things that we want to make sure is true of that data at rest or on the move is that it has confidentiality meaning no one has seen it that shouldn't have seen it, that it has integrity, meaning it hasn't changed from its expected state, and it has availability, meaning those people that have the proper access controls can see it when they want to see it under the conditions that need to be met. That is not privacy, however. Privacy is a contextual idea. Um, it has to do with our, context, our, our expectations around our boundaries uh, privacy boundaries being true um, from context to context. And so privacy security is actually a rather new discipline, and it really has to do with um, finding ways to respect the way that our uh, those boundaries and our, and our expectations change granularly as the context changes. And as that context changes, where do we go in the menu options in a user interface or somewhere in the settings to change those uh, preferences? Um, it's really difficult to do because most privacy protection schemes are, are handled by platforms um, because they're really owners of the data and there hasn't really been an identity layer that we architected the internet with um, that allows the user to have that granular control over their, their very fluid and shifting privacy boundaries. Um, so it's very, one of the difficult things about you know Web 2 um, and increasingly Web 3 is that you have to memorize a lot of different options um, and different uh, kind of terms of service agreements to figure out how your privacy is actually protected and where to go to change those settings when your context changes. 
So um, now that we have a definition of privacy and privacy by design, to some degree at least, um, maybe you can get a show of hands from the audience of like who's technical here, and maybe you can guide the panel to be at that level of technicality. So who's like a developer or would say that they're technical? All right, that's awesome, about half the room, a little more. Awesome. So um, I guess, yeah, in terms of like, you know, let's, let's think about like what is the difference between regular cryptography and zero knowledge cryptography? So I think to sort of try and define that, uh, what I would say is that regular cryptography is more related to encryption and zero knowledge cryptography is the information that you reveal um, and how can you reveal as little information as possible to get the job done. Um, wondering from the panelists, like how would you maybe add to that definition or change it? What, what is your thought on that? Kenny, do you wanna start? Sure. <laughs> so, um, I think you know, when it comes to cryptography, two distinctions here is, um, for example, uh, ZK snark versus a snark, right? And so like, I think there's a little bit of confusion in that there are ways that you can prove things uh, while still revealing the information, whereas there's also ways that you can prove things without revealing the information. I think like, that's where the, 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 key ask, the key differentiator here is proving without revealing any information, right? So like, for example, a, uh, a succinct, I guess, proof analogy would be, I, I wanna prove to you that I'm 21 years of age. Right? And so how can I do that? I can show you my driver's license. That's a proof uh, to some degree that I'm 21 years of age or older. Um, you see all this information about me, but most importantly, you look at my birthday. You now know which day I'm born. Right? Uh, you now know my astrology sign. You know that Kenny's a Gemini. Um, but maybe <laughs> I don't want you to know that. Right? And so you can, I can prove to you that I am not, or I am, I, sorry, that I am uh, 21 years of age or older uh, without showing you my driver's license, without revealing my birthday, right? And there's a lot of ways that I can do that. Um, but the point is that, you know, you now can verify that I'm 21 years of age uh, without, or older, uh, without knowing my exact age, without knowing my birthday, uh, without knowing my astrological sign, um, or anything else that is apparent on my driver's license. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to make that distinguishment between like a proof and a zero knowledge proof. And, and you mentioned this word succinct. So what, what does that mean and why is that important? Yeah, so um, I think especially with a proof, and, and this, I think like when it comes to what we're doing in terms of privacy or building out or uh, you know, implementing proving systems, uh, implementing circuits, whatever it may be, at the end of the day, like it all boils down to user experience. Uh, and when it comes to user experience, right, you want to reduce the amount of clicks that people need to do. You want to remove the amount of thinking that people need to do. You want to remove the uh, amount of time that people need to wait, right? So that level of succinctness, right, like that, that level of efficiency is definitely very critical in terms of like um, the, the user experience. If you go to a website and it takes 20 seconds to load, you're gonna leave that website and you're gonna go to the next Google result. Right, is the same with any sort of aspect of the application layer, and so you know, bringing that efficiency is, um, yeah, it's pretty critical. Anastasia, you seem like you want to say something. Um, I think there's so the the succinct is just like the the S in snark. So, uh, <laughs> so no, that too. Succinct, non non interactive <laughs> arguments of knowledge. Is that the K? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just means that I think it just means that producing the um, Producing the proof is faster and takes like like nanobytes, very small amounts of, of data versus um, actually do, doing the entire proof itself. You can handle that somewhere else, which makes blockchains a lot more efficient. I guess that also probably helps because then if you're if the cost of proving yeah. of verifying the proof was more than actually creating it, you could DOS a lot of networks and then that kind of just changes the whole uh, asymmetry of information processing. So I guess I'm less attackable if, right. if it's succinct. Um, cool, so now that we have common definition, um, maybe we can sort of um, talk about like, okay, now we have all this complex cryptography going on with zero knowledge, right? And we already have cryptography, we've established what privacy means. So what is the point of all of this? What's the point of all of what, sorry? Like what, what is the point of even going into zero knowledge and all of that stuff? Like, um, like, wh why, why have it as opposed to maybe doing things off chain or, uh, you know, like, wh why is zero no knowledge systems important? Mm. You wanna go? I can go. 
Yeah, sure, yeah, I can, I can go. <laughs> so, so I think um, you know, it, it, when it comes to when it comes to Web three, right? When it comes to blockchain, I think there's a there's kind of a confusion here because. People say, oh, why do you need privacy? Isn't the whole point of blockchain supposed to be for transparency and all this other stuff? Um, I, I don't think so. I think the point of uh, blockchain is supposed to have uh, trustless verifiability. right? And if you can have that trustless verifiability uh, in a decentralized manner and layer privacy on top of that, I think like that enhances the user experience significantly. Uh, and so with when it comes to um, zero knowledge proofs, for example, right, like having that in combination with that aspect of decentralization is what makes, I think, blockchain very powerful. Uh, because now we take it to the next stage whereby, you know, the first stage is just Bitcoin. You transact, you can transfer value. Um, that's great and all, right? Limit, limited use cases. Then the next stage was Ethereum and Turing completeness, VMs, et cetera, et cetera. Now you have this explosion of applications and use cases around the applications, but there's limitations on those applications. There's limitations in terms of scalability. There's limitations in terms of user experience, namely privacy, right? And so we can solve these uh, problems with zero knowledge proofs, right? Whether it's on the scalability side or whether it's on the on-chain privacy side then we unlock that next chapter of what we consider Web3 applications and use cases and users. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's why we're kind of exploring this space. And I think I'd just add to that, um, in order to prove your, your identity today, you need to divulge more PII <laughs> to prove the first part of the PII. Um, and that creates what's called a honeypot, many, many honeypots actually. Um, that bring all of the, um, that attract all the kind of the bees to the honey. Um, the bees are attackers, uh, scammers, foreign governments, um, bad agents. Uh, and honeypots are an $8.8 .8 billion data breach business for the enterprising entrepreneur. Uh, so if we want to get out of the business of having to secure all of this really private data in various honeypots, which again, not just for scammers, but bad actors as well, used for influence and what I call um, concealed influence specifically because you don't know you're being influenced using the data that exists about you. Your data trail, your data exhaust, your, your user telemetry, if you will. Um, if we want to get out of that business, which again, $8.8 .8 .8 billion data breach overall, average cost to per, per business in the US is about $8 million a year. Um, then that means we need to reduce our aggregate PII data footprint, and that's where ZK starts to come in. Yeah, um, I would say that, like you know, censorship resistance and like the evolution of like crypto uh, comes with privacy, um, and so I think that's a really great point. Um, I think about it more from like a pragmatic business use case. Um, we talk, we call it non-public information, so you call it PPI. PII. PII. <laughs> I like that. That's, that sounds a lot better. PII. Um, yeah, so whenever you deal with like uh, this in finance, right, it's really, really difficult uh, to take and maintain that. So having like privacy built into that makes it a lot uh, less risky for people. Uh, but I think in terms of like adoption of like Web3 crypto in general, uh, we have to have like privacy built into the infrastructure. Otherwise, people just won't use it. Um, when I talked about like buying a coffee, the last thing I would want to do is like pay for that in a zero X address and let them know about all the things that I'm doing um, in like my financial life. That's just, uh, it's a pretty egregious. Um, you know, breach of my personal privacy, security, a lot of other things, right? Um, and so we can kind of like build that like need to know basis uh, into crypto by using zero knowledge. Yeah, I think if I had to add like one more point onto that, um, I think within our company, we've had like an analogy that if you were to like, you know, pay for a pizza or a coffee with like an Ethereum address, uh, it kind of, your like financial history kind of turns into like a Twitter feed or like your bank account or like your credit cards. Um, so I think like network verifiability is like one of the most important things about Web3 and if we want to like work towards a transition from upgrading like all our applications whether it's like client facing or financial facing um, like ZK offers a lot of stuff in terms of scalability, rollups, improving storage um, and verification is a huge part of that. Um, like EY has started working on Nightfall because they want to start using zero knowledge proofs inside to improve their financial transactions and make it easier for like other institutions to build on top of blockchains. Um, so I think this is a very critical part for like developers and everyone to make a transition from Web 2 to Web 3. So kind of on that point, I think like overall that, that makes a lot of sense. And this is one question that I've, I've had for a long time. Um, 
Is it dangerous to have a lot of small bits of private information about someone, and when you get that in aggregate, then potentially you do end up revealing a lot more than was intended in that specific moment? Um, kind of like how you can, you know, uh, make a lot of uh, judgments based on like, you know, 10,000 data points or whatever, which might not be possible like a few data points. Yes, it's very dangerous. Uh, more interestingly, it's not even the PII that's dangerous. That's what information security concerns itself with, the PII. So we secure the, you know, the date of birth and the, your address and all that stuff, your social security number. Cool. What has not actually been secured in privacy security is the metadata, which is the data that describes the, the data that's being secured. And the metadata is way more interesting because you can easily correlate um, lots of little bits of information to figure out how often a person, let's say, shows up on a street corner in the physical world or in the digital world, how often a person maybe frequents a certain website, what they buy on that website, what they're interested in, when they're angry, when they're influenceable. So it's the metadata, which is not in the purview of information security, that is what um, bad actors or scammers or foreign governments use to target you. And I think it's charming that crypto um, often talks about sovereignty as like data sovereignty as this like rallying cry of what we're doing. Very charming because um, what's actually happening in public by default blockchain <laughs> is that we are taking everything that happened in Cambridge Analytica and actually just making it immutable forever everywhere instead of just on one platform, um, which is all these little data points that are not your PII, right? Like, so you bought an NFT, but the aggregate picture formed by how many NFTs you own, where, what membership, what DAO memberships you're a part of, tell me of a lot about you and how I can use your heuristics, how I can target your heuristics to get you to vote a certain way and do a thing, right? So sovereignty, <laughs> if we're talking about sovereignty, means not only that I own an NFT, but that I have, ac I have the ability to granularly ac uh, control access to it. And I can revoke that access anytime to anyone. Take an example of a home. If I bought a home somewhere, now there's a paper record of me buying a home. But if everyone can enter the home, or everyone can take the couch from my home, then I don't really have sovereignty over that home or that object, the couch. All I have is a paper record or a blockchain record saying I own a certain asset. That's not sovereignty. That's ownership. Sovereignty is your ability to control access and revoke it. For me? <laughs> Anyone want to add anything else to that? Um. Yeah, I was in the healthcare space for a while, uh, specifically working on um, training um, training models to detect like rare diseases and stuff. And uh, this is the exact problem that you have with patient data, right? Because uh, there's a lot of regulation around what you need to anonymize before you can use that data for research purposes. And even the anonymized data set itself is at risk for privacy. Um, if that makes sense. It basically, your privacy can be exposed. Very easy case in point. Let's say, for example, I live in a town uh, that has a population of like 100,000 people. And out of that 100,000 people, there is very likely going to be a chance like that there's another tall six foot one Asian guy that weighs about 200 pounds and et cetera, et cetera, right? And so like, even if you de-anonymize, or if you, even if you anonymize things such as you know my address, my zip code, uh, et cetera, et cetera, if you still have that other data about me, it's very likely the researcher who looks at this and says, six foot tall Asian guy, is that Kenny? <laughs> like, so so the, 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 the being able to take you know, the metadata information and like piece together um, an actual identity is definitely a risk. I think with Web3, though, with blockchain, um, the ability to fragment your identity is so much easier. 
Uh, and if you're able to use that fragmentation of identity through, for example, creating new wallet addresses, right, and, and that combined with that level of privacy, now you're able to dissociate these wallet addresses much more um, effectively than if you were just to create another Ethereum wallet address and you have to load that up with like ETH gas fees um, that are probably sprinkled in from another wallet address that you own, which now links you together, right? And so having that, um, having that fragmentation of that linkage, I think, is a very powerful, effective tool in Web3 that definitely, you know, we, we want to be able to leverage as it comes to like fragmenting your identity and making sure that you're able to verify without having it linked to all other components or aspects of, you know, all, all of your other stuff. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's a great point. So um, besides fragmenting your identity, like are there any other things that, you know, maybe someone in the audience or anyone can sort of take away as um, this is how I can sort of act today so that in the future people aren't, aren't able to piece back what I did like five years ago? Like, it can be someone else. Once, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't use public ledger blockchains, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think you got to incorporate privacy tools into, you know, what you're doing on a regular basis. I mean, something as like simple as like um, learning how to use Tor, um, learning how to use a VPN. Like, anybody here want to like say they don't use VPNs today? I'll show a hand. Uh, everybody should, right? You know, so taking like, um, it's like baby steps, right? I mean, I think if you look at like the most like deep state like spook uh, threat model, right? You know, it's it's kind of a losing battle, but like you can kind of take like small steps to like you know slowly increase like the security and ultimately like the privacy that you uh, enjoy, not just in blockchain, but just like your everyday internet doings. And then, can you talk about now? You know, to to sort of be compliant with regulation, you need to have KYC and AML checks. So. That kind of seems contradictory to the concept of privacy. So how does that kind of work for a lot of these networks where you have to sort of do KYC, but you also want to make sure that your, your kind of core offering of privacy is still maintained? Uh, I, yeah, I can start with that. Um, so for example, at Ironfish, uh, we adopt the sapling protocol, which was first pioneered by um, Zcash. And um, by nature, all of like our transfer transactions are private. So if I were to send you like one wrapped Ethereum on our network, you couldn't see any details. You can't see who it's coming from. You can't see where it's going. You can't see any balances. But um, every account comes with a set of view keys. So depending on the jurisdiction you're in, um, let's say like you're in the United States or if you're in a different country and if you want to buy a currency through our network um, and exchange requires you to provide a certain set of view keys, then some law enforcement can have like direct auditing of your account or wallet without having actual like right control um, over that. So that's one way in which we're solving it, where the individual is still the maintainer and they have sovereign control over all their assets, but um, depending if, you know, if laws evolve to a certain point or exchanges start to enforce certain policy, like this is one way you can kind of get around that. Yeah, so um, on Railgun, we have uh, view keys as well. Uh, I think this is a pretty common thing in, in the, the world of privacy and blockchain, uh, at least like Mina, there's view keys, view keys in, um, in Manta. Oh, yes. Yeah, so like, I, I think it's, uh, <laughs> in, I was, is anybody know, is there view key type stuff in, in the MENA ecosystem? I'm pretty ignorant of that. Anybody know? Anyway, so um, yeah, I think view keys are a really uh, important part of it. I think one of the biggest challenges of view keys is that they are irrevocable. So once given out to someone um, that is like permanent, like damage to your privacy, like I give you my view key, you now have uh, irrevocable right to view my transactions into the past and into the future, frankly. Um, and so this is uh, certainly a challenge. And so one of the things that we're doing as uh, Railgun contributors uh, is we're working on a recursive um, uh, snark system that allows you to make arbitrary statements about your UTXO balance within the, um, in the Merkle tree. Uh, so you could say things like, I am not, um, a, uh, I'm not associated with a particular deposit into the ecosystem. So let's say a bad actor uh, joins the ecosystem. You can prove that you are not them when making a transaction with a, a centralized entity that might need something like this. Uh, you can uh, prove that you're not on some sort of accumulator of a uh, uh, naughty list, like the OFAC sanctions list for uh, chain analysis, this sort of thing. And you can do this in a privacy-preserving way, right? And so you have that like granular control over like the statements that you make. Um, you could take and tie that into an identity statement uh, as well, which I think is really cool. Um, and so I think that like uh, KYC and AML in its like current state uh, do sort of rub uh, with privacy. Uh, especially if you're building it in a super secure way without like back doors and this sort of thing like everyone's probably doing. Um, you have to like build in these tools that like the uh, self-sovereign individual can take and um, 
you know, perform these sort of things, right? Um, and I think that's where it'll go ultimately long term as like the throats to choke um, uh, sort of dissipate and they can't go to these like centralized uh, actors and say, hey Visa, give me all this information about this person. Um, they'll have to go directly to that person and uh, I don't know, serve them a warrant. Um, yeah, I, I want to add on to this specifically because, you know, over at Manta, we've been focusing a lot on um, private identity. And so I, I do want to make a distinguishment here is that there, in my mind at least, there's a difference between privacy and anonymity, right? Whereby anonymity is the dissociation of your entire identity, while privacy is that control over what aspects of your identity that are revealed. And so, a, not a good analogy, but an analogy that I like to use is like a VIP bathroom. Um, and in this VIP bathroom scenario, you have a, a bouncer standing in front of the bathroom, right? And before you can enter this bathroom, the bouncer checks you and see, sees if you have drugs on you, if you're gonna do anything sketchy in the bathroom, right? Okay, you're not gonna do anything sketchy in the bathroom, go ahead, go into the bathroom. Once you're in the bathroom, no one's gonna look at what you're doing in there, right? You're just doing your business and then you come out. No one knows what you did, right? Uh, and so that, I think, is the difference here, right? The privacy itself is once you enter the bathroom, and that anonymity is whether or not there's that bouncer in front of the bathroom. And so this is kind of directly translates into the KYC part of the KYC AML um, issue. And we see a lot of, um, a lot of movement towards on-chain KYC now. And what I mean by that, for example, Binance has their Binance account bound tokens where you know, BABTs, were, it, basically it's like if you KYC on Binance, then Binance will issue you a soul bound token on your BNB chain wallet address. And then you can use that soul bound token to verify, hey, I'm KYC'd on Binance. So you know, obviously I'm a good actor, uh, I think. And same with like a lot of other projects that are also doing these types of like transitions from whether once you're KYC'd, we'll issue you a soul bound token to prove that you've been KYC'd with us. So now the world can know you're a good actor. But when you're just issuing these soul bound tokens, it becomes you know, coming back to the issue of privacy. If I were to go to another application and verify that I have been KYC'd by Binance, that's great. The other application can now see my wallet address. They can now see all the NFTs I own. They can all see all my cryptocurrencies. They can see all of my historical transactions, everything, every smart contract I've interacted with, right? And that's probably something I don't want to reveal just to prove that I'm KYC'd and I'm a good actor in the Web3 ecosystem. And so a lot of what we're working on over here at Manta is creating uh, privacy enhanced versions of these SBTs, which we refer to as ZK SBTs. Mm. Um, we've already minted with uh, you know, the, the Binance account bound tokens. Uh, we're, we're working with a lot of other sort of KYC and on-chain identity partners as well. Um, so I think like that, that sort of bridge uh, for on-chain identity on the KYC side with um, the, the use case enabled by ZK for on-chain privacy is very powerful for you know, proving there are, or proving you're a good actor in the space without revealing inf any information about yourself. And uh, just to keep a track on time and leave enough time for questions with the audience, uh, the last question, maybe Anastasia, you can sort of start us off. Um, what is the connection between zero knowledge and AI, especially in this whole new world of deep, deep fakes and large language, mo language models, and, and what, yeah. what do you think about that? Okay. Oh, wow, that's a, that's a whole other panel, actually. Um, just quickly, I, I wouldn't be too um, discouraged by the existence of specific KYC regulations and how they stand in um, counter to, to ZK, because um, just a show of hands, how many people know what the crypto wars are slash were? Okay, that's... It's like four people. Cool. Crypto wars are not right now. Crypto wars were the 90s when the NSA um, was relentlessly pursuing ways to um, to reduce decryption or actually uh, specifically encryption was uh, considered a munition. It was on the munitions list. It was subject to export controls. And so the NSA was trying to weaken encryption because it was considered a national security risk. But the Overton window on that has shifted. People's public opinion shifted. Um, we couldn't have e-commerce without um, HTTPS, right? And so the pressure from business sh shifted people's expectations around how their data is secured. So then government changed. And it's the same thing here with, Z with ZK, for example. Just because there's a certain KYC regulation doesn't mean that that's doesn't change when businesses say, well, actually, we want to be able to um, run, this is where I might get into AI, um, maybe I want to run a uh, machine learning uh, model as a service, 
Um, and I can't really, I can't really market that because uh, I can't, for example, secure or, or prove that the model that I'm selling is the model that I'm actually running instead of some cheaper model, right? Um, so I want to be able to use a, uh, to offer a proof to my client who's buying my service that this is actually the model that ran, that the attested data in the model is the model that is the data that they bought, or if I want to if I want to sell some sort of like healthcare, um, you know, AI data, right, uh, or the results of a certain AI model. Um, if I can't secure that the or protect that the the private parameters that the model is run on are, remain private, I really can't uh, market that service so I don't get clients. So I really do think that when, we, when we're now moving into the space where AI becomes commodified, becomes, unless, any, unless anybody disagrees here, I think we can all say that AI does become a very important part of every single industry that we all interface with. ChatGPT is the fastest growing, in, in history, the, the fastest growing um, product by a number of users onboarded in a given time. And so as we commercialize these things and as there's business models that develop um, the same way that e-commerce developed you know, in the 90s and, and then early 2000s and needed a way to encrypt user data, as we start to develop commercially available AI, we're going to need a way to secure the underlying private inputs into that data or prove to the client that's buying a certain service that the model that ran is certainly the one that they paid for, which is maybe a very very much more expensive GPT-6 model as opposed to maybe just running the GPT-2 under the hood and they don't know because how can I prove it? And, and what about the ability to sort of fake your identity, maybe to some degree, identity, voice, all of that stuff? Like, does that play into KYC or proving that you are someone or whatever else? Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have like, uh, like, very quickly, like uh, some concerns on like being able to verify like who is who, right? Um, is, have you ever seen like that? Like, um, it's like the video where like the prompt was like Will Smith eating spaghetti. Um, yeah, so like, it's not so real. So yeah, it's real. not good, right? It's not good, but it's gonna be really, it's gonna be really damn good very quickly, right? <laughs> um, and so I think that we'll definitely have to get really creative on like how do we take and like uh, verify that these sort of things are. Um, you know, true and accurate. Yeah, I think it does present some challenges. I think actually um, what's really interesting about uh, machine learning uh, models is that they're trained to, to be able to trick the classifiers. <laughs> the more that a model is able to trick the classifier that's, that's looking at it and saying, is this, is this, is this human or is this, is this like machine created or a bot, the better it, the better it gets. So if the models the basically if how good a model is is based on how well it can trick the classifier we're going to get into a, a situation where we get e more and more disinformation which is already something we're struggling with and now we're getting into a, a place where it's really difficult to differentiate between um, human created um, information and data versus machine created information and data so we're going to need a way to prove provenance and authenticity and that's where zk's come in i think that zk ml is actually the most important use case that anyone in this room should go away with thinking about and researching. Cool, thank you. And I want to make sure we have time for maybe some questions from the audience. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's a treasury report. There's a treasury report from I think last week that suggests that front ends should be KYC. Uh, maybe this is more mostly question to Arofish and Railgun. Do you think that at some point you will consider permissioning your uh, blockchains and your DAP? Uh, yeah, so we, so, so Railgun, the way it works, right, we've just built infra infrastructure, right? So we actually don't run any of the, the front ends. Um, and I, I think that we can, uh, and I, th I guess the reason why we're building a lot of this tooling, like I, I mentioned earlier, we have like a recursive proving system that allows you to make like really cool compliance statements, is that like the people who are building those like front ends uh, can be equipped to do that, right? So for example, like having, uh, we built like a tax compliance um, tool, so you can take an export, um, you know, tax compliance and you know, prove that you've exported all of your uh, transactions, for example, for a given year. Um, and so. We're, we're certainly not like leaning away from like compliance and like government regulation, but trying to like build really strong encryption, or, or, or you know really strong uh, privacy, I should say, and also give people the tooling that they might need uh, in the future uh, if that's the case. So, 
um, if that's what people want to do, right? And take in, and limit who uses and doesn't use. That's uh, certainly the, you know their front end. That's a that's their prerogative. Yeah, I would say we're like pretty similar to that. Like our protocol is mostly focused on like infrastructure, um, and we want to just kind of promote honest computation. So if com like we want to stay as compliant as possible, but it, we basically want people who build on top of our network to have the ability to prove that honest computation was done. Um, and we're just going to focus on like building the network to support all of that. Yeah. So let's say like for example, you wanted to take and develop like a private pool, like a, a, a dark pool of like OTC, for example, and you want to like establish good counterparty risk. Um, you can take and use this recursive proving system to to do that, right? Um, and so I think that like um, you know, so if you're a trading desk that wants to you know enable anonymity into what you're doing in the DeFi ecosystem, um, I think you can you know. We as builders can take and like build something where people can have their cake and eat it too, um, if you will. Yeah, I think like um, this kind of goes along the lines of like just kind of separating between the infrastructure layer and the application layer, and you know it's very much the same that we see in today's world where bad people have money too, right? <laughs> but but what can bad people do with that money, right? Bad people probably can't go to a bank and deposit a million dollars without the bank saying what's the source of your funds. Right, and that's, I think that's a clear distinguishment between the infrastructure layer and the, um, the application layer. At the very fundamental level on the infrastructure layer, right, everyone has access. But then when you go a step up and you want to take that access and convert it into utility, when you want to actually use it for something, right, where can you use it? That's up to the application layer to decide, okay, you know, like we only want users who are Binance KYC. We only want users who are, you know, from, I don't know, South Korea. Uh, or we want all users everywhere, right? And you see that in all sorts of use cases in today's world. You see certain financial institutions that are more lenient on the gray area and certain financial institutions that just say no. And I think we're going to see that very much in the Web3 space too. Thank you. So yeah, we covered a lot of things today, like trying to define privacy, privacy by design, learning what succinctness is, uh, viewing keys, um, how ZKML, what, how, what risk that poses. Um, and, and a bunch of other topics. So kind of as a closing question for the panelists, um, how can the audience stay in touch with you and learn more about your project? And are there any kind of opportunities for them to sort of be more involved with zero knowledge? Maybe starting with you, Kenny, from all the way down. It's always starting with me. Why? <laughs> um, OK, next time I'm going to sit in the middle. Um, so uh, yeah, for us, right, the easiest way to stay in touch is just to follow us on Twitter. It's just Manta Network. I also have my uh, Telegram QR code just glued to my phone. So if anyone wants to connect afterwards, just come up and scan the QR code. Um, yeah? Yeah, that's a real sign of a, a Web3 founder. You have a QR code all over <laughs> the <lock> screen. <laughs> Should have it tattooed, you know, probably. <laughs> Probably uh, age better than the than the uh, Luna <laughs> tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. Depends who makes the tattoo. Sometimes those <laughs> don't age very well. Um, Anastasia, you on Twitter? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you want to learn more about Railgun um, uh, and your technical, we got some really great docs. Uh, we got a really cool SDK. Um, we're going to be participating in a lot of hackathons, which I'm really excited about. So if you want to build with Railgun, uh, we're uh, on Telegram, uh, most of us are in there. You'll find me, Railalulia Churchgoer, uh, a bit sacrilegious, but um, you can find me in Telegram and follow me on Twitter if you'd like. Yeah, for Ironfish, um, you can go to uh, at Ironfish Crypto on Twitter. Um, our Discord is also very active. Uh, we just launched our mainnet six days ago, so we're looking for a lot of interaction, and we want like developers to come onto our system. So please reach out to us. Um, if you want to connect with me personally, we can chat over Telegram. Um, but yeah. Awesome, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your insights, and thank you to the Minna Foundation for hosting this as well. OK. Um, our next session is a fireside chat on ZK programmability between one of our ecosystem partners, Jack Servia, our DevRel, the DevRel engineer at O of One Labs, and one of the ZK cryptographers working on Mina Protocol, Porter Adams, also known as ZK Porter. Uh, take it away, guys. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. So I think we can maybe start with kind of a quick introduction and how we got started ZK programming. Uh, so I guess I'll go first. Uh, I'm Jack Servia. I'm based in Denver, Colorado. I do developer relations at O1. Um, and I got started uh, ZK programming maybe uh, two and a half years ago. 
uh, actually looking to build a product similar to Kaggle, uh, but with, uh, you know, uh, a cryptographic guaranteed instead of, uh, you know, having a custom, uh, having a company that, that uh, um, sort of acts as like an escrow. So, uh, I, Circom was very early on at this point, but it was just becoming usable. I started kind of building things in Circom. Uh, and then I got invited to the first cohort of the ZK App Builders program, which is a, a program that uh, Ovan Labs and Mina put on um, about uh, a year and a half ago, um, where we got some hands-on support uh, from the engineers who were building SnarkyJS, and, uh, and there I worked on, on uh, data availability stuff. So um, a couple months later, I, I ended up uh, you know, applying for the job as uh, Developer relations and, and engineering, and, and now I do uh, both of those things at uh, at uh, O1. Cool. I'm Porter Adams. I'm working in blockchain security at a company called FIO. I've worked in blockchain security for about two years now, and then ZK has been like my biggest interest. I think it's super fun. I actually did go back and find when I first got into ZK because I posted a TikTok about it in 2021. So I like to say I was early. Uh, <laughs> And ever since then, yeah, it's, it's gotten a lot more fun. There's a lot more things happening. Uh, I'll be joining Mina Cohort 2 coming up. And um, yeah, it's a quick intro. Awesome. Uh, maybe something that kind of starts to kick off with is, is some of the differences uh, between uh, the different tools that exist for zero knowledge programming and, and even some of the sort of different paradigms that these tools exist in. Uh, there's some talk on Twitter about, uh, you know, ZK EV, uh, ZK EVM, more specifically, you know, ZK uh, VMs, and then uh, also some. Now we hear this ZK CPU term. Um, I'll, I'll explain the ZK VM, and I'll let you take ZK that CPU. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, so the ZK VM sort of strategy is that you'll kind of have one universal circuit that kind of acts as a backend for everything. And then so you can write all your programs and it's going to compile down and everything uh, will get sort of put into one uh, stuff through one circuit and then output somewhere. Yeah, and, and uh, so if, if ZK CPU sort of paradigms are, are kind of like a, uh, a microcontroller or something, um, the ZK CPU paradigm is more like an FPGA in the sense that uh, when you want to do something, uh, you configure the circuit specifically to do that thing, as opposed to having a general circuit that's programmable um, but always works in the same way. Uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages to, to either uh, approach. Um, one of the things that's cool about uh, ZK VM models is that it's, you know, they, they fit in nicely with kind of the, the, the mechanisms that people use to think about uh, abstracting computer programming uh, today. You know, you can have uh, kind of like a, a base layer, a thing that ingests machine code and does something. Uh, and then on top of that, you can build, you know, higher and higher level languages. Uh, one of the advantages to sort of the ZK CPU paradigm is, is that uh, you can make operations much more efficient in certain cases, the same way that a, a GPU, you know, does some things more efficiently than a, a CPU does. Um, and they're more configurable, I guess. Nice. So. I mean, one thing when I was getting into ZK programming, it's still very confusing. It's, it seems like every day or every week there's a new like backend protocol, like different type of proof system. Um, so how do you kind of keep up with all of those and pick them apart? Yeah, I think um, I think that there's uh, th there's definitely lots of progress being made on kind of a couple of different fronts. There's been sort of a Cambrian explosion of Zero knowledge proof stuff in general uh, in the last year or two. Um, there are some advances that are pretty substantial, and I think one that's kind of on um, uh, people's radar now more than it was, say, six months ago, is this idea of recursive zero knowledge proofs. Uh, I um, I know that uh, well. Mina kind of ended up uh, requiring this technology before it had a lot of mainstream interest. And so we have 
uh, kind of a working implementation of it almost by accident now. But it's cool to see other people start to think about uh, what you can build with this. And I don't know, uh, Porter, if you have any ideas for, well, first of all, if you want to maybe take a crack at explaining the idea of uh, you know, recursive zero knowledge proofs and then, and then maybe some of the interesting use cases for them. Yeah. I think it's actually a very like natural, intuitive idea where like once you have the idea of zero knowledge proofs, so you can prove some computation is done correctly. It's like, well, can you prove that, that proof was done correctly? And then once you get that paradigm, then you can just recurse infinitely and and prove everything was done correctly. Yeah, exactly. And and so you know, in theory, all zero knowledge proof systems can, uh, well, all general zero knowledge proof uh, systems can uh, can be used to prove the verification of other zero knowledge truths. But in practice, it's generally so inefficient as to be infeasible. Um, and so the real trick here is in, in making this uh, efficient enough that, that the juice is worth the squeeze, kind of. And uh, so Mina's proof system Kimchi uh, has this. And there's some work being done, uh, like by Xerox Park, uh, so that you can do sort of similar things with, with CIRCOM. Um, Starkware and RiskZero have both talked a bit about uh, enabling this technology in the future, but it's, it's not quite here yet. Uh, and, and one of the things that you might you know, kind of want to be able to do with these proofs is, is um, let's say you have some kind of computation that scales uh, horizontally. You, like it's, it's too much to be able to feasibly do on one machine. You could have multiple machines do a part of the computation, prove that they've done it correctly, and then actually verify the proofs that each of those machines creates within another proof. And, and the result, you have a, a single proof that attests to the fact that the work many machines have done uh, was all done correctly. You can also attest to long-running processes in this way. Like if I do some work every day, I can do the work, prove it, and then also verify the proof of the work I did yesterday. And then I can just forget the proof of yesterday. And so we can have with just a single proof, uh, um, we can basically prove something add more to what we prove, um, and then forget the, the old proof. So we can have a fixed size proof that attests to more and more information over time. Yeah. I actually just got back from a month long trip in Montenegro um, with Vitalik and some other people. And like everyone there is just talking about like recursive proofs and folding schemes and how do we like basically take all this information and compress it down. I think this is like such an exciting time and it's crazy that Mina was like kind of years ahead of or like a couple years ahead of everyone else and like getting this going. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, Porter, uh, are there any things that you've kind of thought about building uh, with recursive zero knowledge truths yourself, or or, or just with with uh, nor normal zero knowledge truths? <laughs> I think there's a ton of fun ideas. Uh, one, because I'm in security, one idea I saw recently is a uh, proof of exploit, which I believe was done uh, a while ago, Amina. But um, the idea of proof of exploit is that you can. Uh, if there's a bug in some smart contract, you can prove that there is a, like, you, I, I can prove that there's something wrong with your smart contract without revealing exactly what's wrong. And this is important for, like, bug bounty researchers and security because um, I would like to maybe get paid for my research. And so I can prove to your protocol, hey, like, I'm legit, I'm trying to help here. Um, I would like to get paid for helping secure your project and just prove nicely that there is an exploit, but I won't give it away until I get paid. So. Yeah, this is really cool. Um, do you see, uh, let's see, do you uh, see like a, a, this as being um, like a, a, an important part of I, I guess like security research going forward. So the the challenge is just it's it's actually the zk programming of it is like if you're already doing all of the work of a security researcher, if you have to do like the extra step of trying to zk prove everything, then that's kind of just one more th painful thing you might have to go through, yeah. and it might be too much effort. So. Yeah. So there's kind of space for like general protocols here. Uh, to make this more user friendly for maybe security researchers. Yeah. Very cool. Um, have you thought, uh, I mean, I know that in the last talk we talked a little bit about uh, ZK AI stuff. Um, 
I know you've had a few thoughts about this <laughs> recently. Yes. Uh, I mean, ZKAI is like, let's just combine all the buzzwords. Yeah. And then at first I thought it was kind of just a meme, but turns out it's, yeah, insanely useful and practical. And I'm watching all kinds of, yeah, like fundings being sent at it. Yeah. And everyone says it's the most important idea. Uh, yeah, there's there's kind of a couple uh, different ways that ZK and, and, and artificial intelligence can uh, Kind of come together. Uh, one is is uh, you know proving uh, inference from already trained models. Uh, I think they talked a bit about that in the in the panel before us. Um, but there's other interesting things you can do. Like uh, I think uh, zero knowledge truths make it possible to do federated learning in a different way than has been done before. You could you know have models that are important to some businesses kind of like core offering um, and allow people to prove that they are sort of not uh, not malicious actors and then also to prove that they've updated uh, you know they can do a small training step themselves and prove that they've updated these uh, parameters uh, correctly and, and send this back then to the the uh, the organization that controls sort of the big model um, and in this way maybe it's possible for people to start training machine learning models on information that they would never be comfortable sharing. Uh, you know, of course, because they're, they're not leaking it. They're just leaking sort of the result of, uh, you know, the, the differences in, in the parameters of the model over time. Uh, and so I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what kind of cool stuff you can get out of that. But I think a lot of uh, machine learning stuff has, has been limited. Like, in, in terms of what people have been able to build, this has been limited by uh, the fact that even though people are comfortable sharing a lot of their information, they're not comfortable sharing all of it. Like, uh, if I could share all of my, uh, let's say, uh, if I could share all of the messages that I'd ever sent to anybody and have them used to, to kind of uh, like uh, tune a model like GPT, um, I would be comfortable doing this uh, in a setting where I was, I was sure that the only thing that would change is the model and that people wouldn't be able to see sort of uh, uh, the data granular at a granular enough level to really make sense of what I'm doing. Yeah. I have another example, which is I used to work for a company called Learning Economy, who's doing a lot of cool things in the Web3 like education space. And one challenge that they ran into is that they were working with a lot of schools who have all this educational data on students, in particular, like which students took which classes, got which grades. And one thing that they would love to do is sort of like combine that into an AI model to sort of get feedback on sort of how to like those classes compare to other classes, sort of which classes are actually leading to kids being successful later in life. And but the, the, none of the schools want to share data with each other because mm -hmm. of the like yeah, privacy problems. And so if you could combine each individual school's data sets, you could get like really interesting insights into the education. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Uh, and I think it's actually also interesting because, of course, there's a fair amount of overhead in proving anything using any zero-knowledge proof system today. Um, it uh, means that, you know, for something like, I don't know, if you want to prove a GPT inference, it could be really, really, like, a lot more expensive than, than just sort of uh, getting the, the inference and not, and not proving it. But with something like this, it sounds like... Uh, a lot of these models would probably be very simple um, or relatively simple. You don't need to have you know, a crazy amount of complexity in order to get meaningful insights. Uh, and it's, it's truly just a matter of kind of being able to separate the insight from uh, the, the data. I'm imagining almost like, uh, I don't know if anybody here has worked with Hadoop, but basically uh, we have sort of like a map reduce for uh, all of the, uh, the different school system computers. All right, we can send like a query. We want uh, some. We want you to run this on your data and give us back the results. And then the school system can choose uh, if that uh, query is reveals too much information or not. And if it doesn't, then they can send the the response back uh, and prove that they've generated it correctly. Yeah, uh, it's it's crazy how much these like um, sort of smaller building blocks can like enable so much more to happen. Like. Even all of blockchains kind of that way. Like, <laughs> started with one paper, like it's like eight pages long, yeah. ten years ago, and like look at us now. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Uh, and and this um, 
I, I guess we should talk a little bit about tools, but I also, um, I mean, I think something that is really cool is, is you know, zero knowledge proofs have, uh, uh, I mean, people have been thinking about them for quite a few years now, but it wasn't really until like 10 or so years ago that, that uh, there was enough of an incentive for, for people to start like really trying to build this. And, um, and if I even think back to like, you know, three years ago when I was using SORCOM, it was, uh, it couldn't do very much and it was very hard to make it do anything. Uh, and, and then kind of when you look at how far just in three years things have come, you know, there's four or five uh, really cool, very usable toolkits uh, now. Uh, and um, they all offer, you know, unique features. Uh, of course, I'm pretty partial to Snarky JS, but uh, um, it's uh, at, at the same time as this is happening for zero knowledge truths now. Uh, there are other kinds of encryption that uh, I'm sorry. There are other kinds of you know like cryptography that uh, that people are researching more seriously because you know blockchain is able to provide a like a funding mechanism for this. Like uh, you know fully homomorphic encryption schemes, fully homomorphic encryption schemes inside of zero-knowledge proofs, and uh, like all sorts of MPC stuff. Uh, and so my hope is that you know, in the next couple of years, we see this sort of same Cambrian explosion for, for a couple of other core ideas, and that this really reshapes the way that uh, people build and interact with applications. Oh, yeah. Now, we're going to get a little off topic, but witness encryption, start looking it yeah. up now if you haven't heard about it yet. Um, basically, you can encrypt data so that only like when some problem's solved, um, it'll be like, sort of revealed by that. And so, yeah, it enables crazy things. It's awesome. Very cool. <laughs> um, so, I, I guess speaking to tools a little bit, like uh, as you've kind of like uh, you know progressed on this journey, is there any aspect of the developer experience that you found to be kind of particularly hard and do you have any advice to somebody who's maybe uh, trying to you know kind of cross this hurdle themselves yeah I think up front it just feels a little intimidating and I even have a math background in cryptography and it still was like whoa I don't know like <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of buzzwords I mean even yeah. just like getting the prover and the verifier straight for me was like a lot in the beginning and there's witness generation and constraints and all these other like specific buzzwords and it has gotten a lot better basically there's really good onboarding there's good tutorials and so just go play with it first you don't need to understand all the math um, just try it out and you'll find like once you get going that you can already do some pretty cool stuff just right away and if you want to go learn some more math or details later you can but just start playing with it yeah I absolutely second everything Porter said uh, it's easy enough to just go build something now that that's the best place to start. And, and really, almost the only thing that I would uh, encourage people to kind of dive into early in the journey is, is this, if you're not familiar with this idea of finite fields, um, you know, these are kind of like the, the equivalent of like unsigned integers and zero knowledge proofs. They're the most kind of primitive uh, type. Um, there's not too much to, to learn about them. Division works a little bit differently. Um, certain other operations are a little bit different, but for the most part, they're pretty similar to unsigned integers. And uh, as soon as you kind of get your head around how these work, it gets a, you know pretty straightforward to think about uh, what's going on. What do you think zk programming is going to look like in like five or ten years? Like, yeah, this is an awesome question. I think that um, I hope it looks like Lisp machines. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, I, uh, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that people are going to continue to build more and more interesting uh, ZK VM solutions, um, like Starkware and, and Risk Zero both have things that work. Um, but, uh, but I also hope that, uh, um, yeah, in, in more kind of this like ZK CPU space that we're operating in, I hope that people uh, actually start building ZKVMs that exist on top of our uh, ZK CPU. The advantage to the ZK CPU right now is that it's, uh, you know, and this really just means uh, creating circuits directly from um, uh, our, our um, you know, our DSL goes sort of straight into a circuit instead of going into some sort of machine code for like a pre-compiled circuit. I think that there's a lot of space for people to um, build 
like uh, programming paradigms on top of something like Mina that can plug into uh, some of the flexibility and efficiency advantages that we provide, um, such that like, you know, maybe um, if you, like there's no reason that somebody couldn't build you know zk evm on on mina uh it's it doesn't necessarily make sense uh yes but my hope is that the, i'm sorry i'm kind of rambling here that my hope is that the 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 added flexibility and sort of power of the zk cpu paradigm will allow people to kind of venture off in different directions and hopefully find some really cool stuff like uh, I, I said the list machine thing earlier kind of as a joke but i think especially um in the case of Mina, we have you know this recursive proof system, and this really means that uh, like I can envision a world where somebody writes a smart contract on Mina that can process. Um, you know, we have a couple of different uh, basically Lisp primitives, uh, and if we can process all of these, then people can build large abstract functions that live like sort of wherever, you can get almost like multi-threaded Ethereum is kind of, I think, what I'm going towards. And you can get it with a par programming paradigm that makes sense. This is pretty hand wavy. Um, but we have a couple of people in the ZK Ignite cohorts who are working on this kind of thing. And it's really, really interesting. Nice. Yeah, one thing I'd like to see is just more hype around ZK apps. I think most of the ZK hype so far has been on like ZK VMs, ZK yeah. L1s and moving it up to the application layer where there are so many possibilities. Like, I'd love to just see, I think, I think it's starting a yeah. little bit, especially the MENA cohorts are doing a lot for that, but the, um, more, more ZK app hype. Yeah, I, I'm too in the weeds on this stuff. It's uh, easy to sort of lose the, the forest and the trees or whatever the saying is. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, Z, ZK apps are, are something that you can go build today. It's, uh, really? Strunky Jess is, is pretty mature. It, it pretty much does what it says now. Uh, you can go build something in a matter of hours. And uh, it, uh, it really is like, uh, it, you know, hard to kind of uh, justify the difficulty that comes with, with trying to make Solidity run in, in uh, a zero knowledge proof uh, when you can just go write your program straight in JavaScript uh, and, and have you know, even more sort of access to low level stuff, but also a higher level paradigm. Uh, you can make the things you need to be efficient more efficient, but you can also, you know, the things that are simple, they're just simple. Uh, it's the same as, you know, what you're used to. Yeah, I don't want people to be intimidated by like, you hear how difficult it is to build a ZK EVM and there's all these like yeah. challenging constraints. like. ZK apps are like you, you can build some relatively straightforward, simple programs that do really, really cool stuff. I think there's going to be like a ton of jobs in this field yeah. soon. And so like this is worth your time if you're a developer to try learning ZK apps now. Yeah, building a ZK VM is hard because it's sort of like a square peg in a round hole type situation. Um, but ZK apps are a really natural fit. The the you know, Snarky JS mirrors sort of what's going on under the hood uh, very well, and uh, and this means it's easy to pick up, but it's also easy to to go on and implement complicated things. You don't have to deal with these kind of uh, situations where you have to come up with really complicated workarounds. Everything kind of fits together very cohesively. Uh, how much time do we have left? We're done. Oh, oh, no time left. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, cool. I was just gonna, I was just gonna yell. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of like, um, a lot of like the toolkit for like zero knowledge is written in like JavaScript runtime, mm -hmm. uh, which tends to not be very performant, uh, yes. as opposed to things like C plus plus and Rust. And so, like um, the hardware, like advancements are really, really fascinating to take and make it more performant. But I'm wondering, like, if you guys know of any really cool and interesting projects where people are taking and, like, you know, converting libraries to, like, you know, more native and, you know, multi-threaded, like, capable libraries where, like, I don't have to have, like, a very sophisticated machine and I can do, you know, zero-knowledge type computation on a, 
Smartphone, for example. Yeah, so I should say, uh, I mean, me, SnarkyJS does this today. Uh, so, of course, the JS part of SnarkyJS is written in JavaScript, but almost everything under the hood is uh, OCaml and Rust that compiles into Wasm or into machine code if you're running outside the browser. Um, and so, uh, we really can uh, generate proofs, you know, on a phone today in, in, in less than a minute that uh, do meaningful things. Uh, Yeah. And so that's like created like one of the bigger challenges for, for us at least is like we've had to go back to the drawing board and be like, okay, well how do we write this in C plus plus so it's not just in uh, Apple that's a uh, Yeah, right right now we're focused, you know, mostly on uh uh I guess it's to that point like you were saying yeah. the CK app thing. I think this is it's a really good point, right? It's something that's really fascinating and it's how we like proliferate zero knowledge into like more and more hands. Uh, but I think a lot of the challenges come from like yeah, this is interesting. I think this is something that we haven't ran into as much, uh, just because we've focused very much on you know uh, browsers up until this point. Um, I will say it, it does run. Uh, I'm almost sure that I have been I have been able to run a zk app on an iPad before, um, and we have. Uh, I, I worked on. There's some. There's some tuning. Uh, Snarky just figures out what machine it's running on and changes quite a few things for the sake of efficiency. Like uh, Apple Silicon machines, wor stuff works differently, and so in Snarky JS, the stuff also works differently. Is that time? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Porter. Thanks. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you everybody for attending. That was a really amazing talk. And just to remind people that if they are interested in building ZK apps on Mina, our next cohort is, we've got signups open right now, scan that QR code, and you could join it. it the, there's great funding, there's great help, there's great assistance, there's great people involved. It's a really great program. Um, okay, so our next session will cover some thoughts on the future of zero knowledge, moderated by uh, Dylan Kugler, our Director of Global Ecosystem Business Development here at MENA Foundation. Very long title. Um, please, uh, please welcome Dylan to the stage. And if the other panelists could come up and take a seat on stage two, that would be great. This guy's a savage. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, my name is Dylan. I work at the MENA Foundation. Extremely excited to be here. And I just want to thank everyone for coming by, the speakers, the audience, a pretty cool turnout, especially when you compare it to what it would have been a year or two years ago. So thanks everyone for coming by. I'm joined by an incredible group of panelists here to talk about the future of ZK, we'll chat a little bit about adoption, trends, leave some time for questions at the end. But let's just kick it off with uh, maybe Walt, can you introduce yourself? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Walt. I work on the venture team at Galaxy, which is basically kind of a full service financial merchant bank. So does it investing, has a pretty big OTC um, trading desk as well, as well as like a, a staking arm, a market making arm, basically kind of anything you need in the crypto Web3 world. So yeah, ventures at Galaxy, thanks. Uh, I'm Ben, uh, I work at Veridice. my mic on? Yes, Okay, great. Uh, so we're a security company. We do uh, audits. I kind of got roped into the ZK space by one of our co-founders, who was my advisor at UT here in Austin. Um, so a group of formal methods researchers uh, have wound up turning their focus towards uh, securing the web landscape. Cool, yeah. Uh, my name is Arnav. I work on the ventures team at Hashkey Capital. Uh, Hashkey is a venture firm based in Hong Kong. Uh, we've been investing in the space since 2015, um, have quite a few port codes, uh, including Alchemy, DYDX, quite a few others. So super stoked to be working there, have some great founders to work with. And yeah, we are actively investing. And I'm Justin Havens, crypto Texan on Twitter. So <laughs> I'm in Texas. These are my roots. This is great. Uh, I work on the growth team at Polygon Labs, focusing more on the decentralized finance side of things. And yeah, Polygon Labs, we develop uh, and maintain the Polygon protocols. Thanks, everyone. So 
To start off, I'd like to unpack some areas that ZK is targeting within the crypto world. I see ZK as an enabling tech for privacy, scalability, succinctness, <laughs> verifiable compute, interoperability. These are all topics that we will be discussing today, either on this panel or you know, the prior panel uh, or in the future panel. Um, what interests you the most within ZK? And bonus points if you can add what ZK enables that was previously impossible. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, so the question was, what are you most excited about and what, out of what it enables? Yeah. Um, I think definitely the scalability uh, kind of factor just kind of speaks for itself. Um, I think just speeding up consensus a lot by, and, and making a lot more data available on chain is, is really, really, really promising, whether that's through a rollup or, or some other scheme. Um, but I think like the more like niche use case that I'm excited about is like it, it won't be super financialized I think but um, an element of privacy for like cross border payments. So stable coins are kind of like crypto's golden use case, right? Like any any sort of like what's the ultimate application for crypto? It's probably stable coins, or at, at least today it is. And stable coins are so great because cross border payments are, are notoriously difficult because you normally have to use a trusted middleman and the trusted middleman has to KYC and, and, and know both parties on each end. And crypto kind of lets you bypass that. It lets you use like a neutral protocol where we have two people on either end that can kind of trust each other and, and just use the protocol um, services but actually not have to identify themselves. But that isn't actually the case. You, today you can audit a lot of um, what goes on basically everything that goes on in crypto. And I think that audibility does limit like tail use cases for someone who's trying to send like their nephew uh, money in a different country or if they're trying to escape like a bad regime. And I think anything that kind of like moves towards like uh, programmable privacy where you can um, get around like poor regulation or like evil regulation is a good thing. So that's, that what, that's what excites me the most. Yeah, that stuff is really exciting. I know privacy is obviously a huge thing, but for me, the most interesting part has been the verifiable compute aspects. I think, like, if you look back to the knots or the early teens, everybody was talking about big data, big data this, big data that. And one thing that, you know, Web3 has kind of struggled with is managing large data sets when, you know, gas fees get really expensive or you don't want to do complicated computations on chain. You have to rely on some sort of trusted party. And so being able to verify these things, being able to bring in more complicated data feeds, even you know, verifying trusted sources of data in an on-chain manner where everything is you know, as trustless as possible, I think is really exciting and just wasn't possible before ZK. Totally, yeah. I think I'll second that. I love, obviously, privacy and verifiable compute use cases. I think I'll add I really like the interoperability use cases. I think ZK bridges are super unique. Um, in particular, I really like you know ZK Bridge, their parallel proof generation, and then you know transforming that into a snark. I think that's really novel. I think ZK IBC has a ton of potential. Another great use case, you know, increasing the extensibility of the battle hardened IBC, and then also reducing the cost of on chain verification. Um, and then also you have uh, you know Sync Labs fully on chain Ethereum like client, not using the Sync or the Sync committee. I think that's also super interesting. So love the uh, ZK and interop space. Yeah, and not to repeat too much of what y'all have already said, but like privacy, security, scalability are, are very big ones, obviously. But I think what most interests me about the ZK space is it's so new and so cutting edge. Well, it's not new. It's been around since the 80s, right? But like in, in the implementation of blockchain technology and what we're actually using it for, it's, it's really exciting. And if you really want to get a good grasp of how deep that ZK ocean is, like just go listen to Anna Rose's ZK podcast because uh, I don't know anything they're talking about. Um, and I work at Polygon, and we do ZK uh, layer two scaling solutions. So uh, just the future potential of what this space can bring. That's awesome. And we'll be touching on the future potential quite a bit. For me personally, I think the fact that you can create succinct blockchains combined with recursion creates a very beautiful type of blockchain architecture. Keep in mind, I am biased. I work for Mina, so <laughs> keep that in mind. But, you know, Justin, you, you touched on a point. ZK has been around since the 1980s, but only recently found a foothold in crypto recently. So my question is, why now? What has sparked this surge of interest over the past year or so within ZK? And what makes ZK such a good fit with blockchain technology? 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk a little from the DeFi side too, since that's kind of what I, what I focus on. But I think where, why this adoption has gained so much ground lately is just because of demand, right? I think like in the 80s and 90s, like maybe it was a little just more academic. And now that we have this distributed ledger technology, you know, we can now offer in decentralized finance uh, a lot of benefits of like disintermediation, self-custody, uh, transparency. Uh, which is nice, but also there are a lot of factors that the traditional finance space still has that there is demand for, like privacy and uh, scalability is another thing. And so I think that that demand and that need for this type of technology in this space has been like, really, that's what's been the ultimate driver, in my opinion. I think there's uh, two reasons, in my opinion, that blockchain has been the catalyst for ZK adoption. I think the first reason is because um, you look at uh, blockchains today, I think we can all agree they are compute constrained. So the ability to fundamentally use rollups to perform you know, computation off chain and then prove it much cheaper on chain, I think that was the primary catalyst because it was instant product market fit there. Um, and I think the second reason is I think ZKPs fundamentally embody the ethos of, I think, Ethereum and just blockchains in general. I think it embodies decentralization, trustlessness, permissionlessness, um, and honestly much more, including privacy and whatever else. So I think those are the two reasons uh, to me. That's awesome. So I want to spend a decent part of this conversation just on real use cases that you see ZK enabling. I'm gonna to try to bias you a little bit more to the application side, given the first question was a little bit more infrastructure focus. So, you know, Walt, you were chatting, chatting a little bit about stable coins, but, you know, any other use cases that you guys see within crypto or outside of crypto that you're extremely excited about with ZK? Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a good place to start. So the way I kind of think about it is like we have all these different teams kind of working on different implementations. There's a lot of experimentation. And it used to be, I was kind of joking outside with someone, like it used to be every six months there'd be a new proving scheme. And now it's every month or every week. So it, it, it's a lot to keep up with. But um, I think with this experimentation, we don't really know where we're going to land. And we don't really know all the commercial applications yet. It is fundamentally like a new technology, even if it's been around forever. And I think we're going to see, just like, I think Dan Bonet has actually talked about this. Like in the space race, you know, NASA implemented uh, all these things to get to the moon. But they actually invented a lot of stuff along the way that had totally different applications. No one thought Velcro would end up being used in like half of the clothing in the world. I mean, that's probably pretty optimistic, but you get the point. Um, so for ZK specifically and for privacy, I think we're going to see within the application layer um, almost like a retooling where privacy itself is like an input into the system. And depending on what system you're operating and what application you're working on, you implement that feature in a different way. So for something like DAOs, you could have you know, a semblance of like private voting where historically like operating a DAO, first off, is, is very, very difficult. It's very hard to internalize your costs. You know, there's no like coast theorem where you can be like, okay, we're gonna have uh, this this actor outside of our system, and we're gonna have this one inside the system with the salary, right? You can't really do that with the DAO because it's decentralized, it's cross cross border, so it makes it really hard to do things that you would do in a traditional company. Like if a DAO wanted to sell some of its tokens that it could fund development for something else, it's probably gonna get front run, right? Because like everyone's gonna see the vote ahead of time. So if you enable like private voting you can limit some of that. Now, we still have to deal with you know, MEV, which is a different conversation, which I think probably <laughs> relates to this in a little bit. Uh, but I, I think just like something like that, right, where you can plug in privacy just into voting itself. And if the vote passes, now all you have to do is actually complete the transaction. Instead of having everyone in the system be able to view it and kind of audit exactly what that organization is doing ahead of time. So almost this idea of like programmable privacy. I think I can touch some on these applications as well, uh, just from some of the audits we've gotten to do. On the identity side, you know, we were talking in one of the previous panels, they mentioned how difficult it gets to be when you're trying to manage all these accounts across what has become a pretty fractured, you know, ecosystem with all the different chains that you might be involved in. Uh, so Sysmo, for instance, with these kind of types of identity aggregation uh, schemes where not only are you helping the UX some and, you know, You've seen lots of developments in just the normal DeFi landscape with things like account abstraction, but adding in the ZK side of things lets you do it in a way where you just 
don't have to worry about someone linking all of your accounts together and finding every single thing you bought over the past 10 years. And you know, being able to aggregate your identity so that you have a really smooth UX, but not giving away more than you know, exactly what you want to give away uh, is a really cool application that you know, is already out there. And uh, so that's, I think, one of the more impressive ones. <coughs> I think one of the more interesting application layer use cases that I've seen for ZK recently is um, being able to cryptographically prove financial health. So a good example would be like I think Proven's tool set that they're building out where you can essentially as a stablecoin provider or as a prime broker prove that you are fully solvent, fully backed, uh, you know, completely cryptographically. Um, and I think going down that lane of just being able to prove many things um, cryptographically, at least in the financial world, on the balance sheet. Um, I really do think that's uh, really rich um, applications for ZK in the near term. In the long term, of course, I'd like to see more on identity, ZK, KYC, uh, ZCAPTCHA, I saw that recently. So plenty of cool stuff going around in the ZK application layer, but you know, definitely really early as far as um, you know, what's possible, but still following it for sure. Yeah, I think uh, using ZK Tech on the application layer is probably the most exciting thing for me. I mean, for so long it's been, you know, we've got it on the L1, L2, or like other, you know, uh, layer ones, like, uh, you know, like Zcash, and now we've got Polygon ZK EVM, little shill there, sorry. And, uh, but, <laughs> it's, but it's really exciting, oh, and Mina, Mina's great too. <laughs> uh, but it's really exciting to see projects like Railgun, we had Alan that was up here earlier, you know, they're doing privacy um, from, a, from a DeFi perspective, that's exciting. Sysmo, which you talked about earlier, like that proof of at the attestation that you can do there, um, that's really exciting, like on-chain voting, I think, and there's also ZK Bob, like there's so many new, projects that are just being developed on the DeFi side of things using you know, leveraging the ZK tech but I think it would be really interesting to see you know what kind of potential is there outside of the DeFi and maybe like governance aspects which are just a little untapped right now I've seen like a couple projects that are kind of working on it like in like the metaverse NFT space but you know that that remains unseen but I think that just kind of goes back to like my first answer of you know this is still like such an untapped, underused technology. Um, it's exciting to see what the future holds, in my opinion, on the app layer. That's awesome. I mean, I really just see ZK as sort of the third wave of crypto. Bitcoin, P2P money, Ethereum programmable smart contracts, ZK actually bridging real world data into Web3. Um, you know, just to follow up on a couple of your points, Justin, uh, on the application layer. You know, within ZK, a lot of the innovation has occurred at the infrastructure layer. Uh, what is needed from like a developer perspective to bring some of the innovation to the application layer where it can actually impact the end user experience? Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't think it's too dissimilar from what we need uh, just for onboarding, you know, Web 2 developers into Web 3 in general, right? Like we're still kind of going over that big hurdle. like teaching developers, you know, how to use smart contracts and solidity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then it's like, oh, hey, now check out this insanely crazy cryptographic, you know, like Plonk and Plonky and recursive Starks and all this other crazy stuff. I think it's just going to take time. folding schemes now. That's a new oh, thing. folding yeah. schemes, yeah. And what was the witness thing I heard earlier? On the encrypted, encrypted witness. Encrypted witness, yeah. Yes. That's exciting, too. Um, it's just going to take, take time. It, but to, like, help progress that time forward a little bit and expedite it, uh, just education, things like this. But like, I think outreach to Web2 developers and Web3 developers, uh, that's something that we've kind of noticed at Polygon Labs is the pool of Web3 developers is, is pretty small, but the pool of Web2 developers is so freaking big. And like, we need, we need to start a little bit more outreach and reaching out to them to bring them in. And then once we bring them in, you know, teach them ZK on the app layer too. Oh yeah, totally. So yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you said. I think you hit all the spot on. Obviously, Dev Tools will will definitely get better, more libraries. Um, and I think where we're very lucky is with the you know solidity solidity in the EVM. We have a lot of battle hardened tools, a lot of phenomenal libraries out there. I think once we get closer to that maturity, it'll be more suitable for newer developers, so they don't have to worry so much about writing like under constrained circuits or you know it's it's very hard to code in uh, in zk. So I look forward to you know just a more mature uh, dev stack, and I think that will you know accrue more adoption. 
Yeah, you mentioned uh, under constrained circuits from like a security perspective. A lot of these languages that we're working with now are really, really difficult to use. Just, I mean, if you look back at programming since the dawn of time, just keeping track of one semantics is really tricky. If you're using something like CIRCOM and you're having, you know, to keep track of two at the same time, it's a really cool language. It's brought ZK to, you know, way more people. Awesome project. It's just, you know, hard for anybody to keep track of two things when they're when they're trying to do one. Um, so I think kind of a lot of the new projects and frameworks that things like SnarkyJS or Risk Zero are really, really good directions. These, uh, you know, VMs and CPUs are going to really change the landscape, I think. Um, but it's also just going to take a long time. You know, like you mentioned, Justin, the research is just evolving so quickly. And so you wind up with competition between usability and, you know, using the latest research and getting the most performance out of what you want. So, you know, we are seeing a broadening landscape where you can really start to pick and choose, and that's a good sign. But I think a lot of it is just going to take time. Yeah, perfect, Ben. I want to also just follow up on one point that you made on VMs and CPUs. So there are many different tools, languages, frameworks. Uh, do you see that, like project-specific environments winning out? Or do you see developers trending more towards a you know, ZK VM or ZK CPU type model? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for the standard developer, especially people who are new, you know, as we're onboarding people from Web2, uh, a lot of them are just going to want to use JavaScript or something that can compile down to Risk Five if you're using Risk Zero, or you know something that they're used to. And there, the VMs and the CPUs are just going to shine. And I really think that's going to be essential for the onboarding process. As you're talking to more and more, you know, enterprise level organizations where, you know, for instance, maybe you have a massive AI model that people are querying all the time because they need to write an essay or whatever. Uh, you know, they're. <laughs> You're not going to want to, uh, you know, go cheap on performance, and so you're probably going to wind up using some sort of custom solution because you can't expect the generic uh, version to just be lightning fast for every application. So I think for large organizations, the specialized uh, implementations are, are probably going to hold out for a while. Cool, perfect, Justin. I'm going to pick on you again, just as our DeFi expert and. You know, DeFi is probably one of, if not the most important thing for any kind of ecosystem, just in terms of onboarding developers and users. How would, I know I want to take a little step back with the user experience again. Like, how would the user experience be changed with a ZK component for DeFi? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, like from a scalability perspective, like if you're looking at Polygon ZK EVM, uh, you're essentially adopting the security of Ethereum, which most believe is very, very secure. And uh, it, you know, you're, you're kind of sharing in that transaction cost where you're, you're batching transactions down to, to mainnet. And so the ultimate time to finality is uh, significantly improved other, over other scaling solutions. And like if you're, if you're on mainnet and you're paying you know, $20 for a transaction fee, um, that's bad user experience in my opinion versus like a, a scaling solution where you're paying a much, much less expensive, like a dollar transaction fee. That's a much better user experience. 20x better, if you ask me. But, you know, I think, like, at Polygon Labs, like, our goal, and probably everyone else here, is, like, to onboard the next 1 billion users to Web3 and DeFi in this ecosystem. And, you know, we've, we've got to focus on these things. Um, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, like, decentralized finance provides a lot of benefits, especially, like, in the permissionless aspect of it. Um, but there's just, you know, there's things the traditional finance space still offers that is better from a UX perspective, and that is privacy. Like, that's, that's big. Like, if I buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, like, I don't want someone in the Starbucks accounting department to go through and, like, be able to see all of my transactions, right? Um, and then, yeah, and just scalability, like, faster transaction speeds is, is also important, right? Like, Right now, transaction speeds on Ethereum are like 12 to 13 seconds, I think. Um, but if you have like half a second or one second transactions, like there's more innovation that you can build on top of that. Like yield aggregators is something that comes out of that uh, quicker block time speed. So th there's just a lot that uh, I'm super excited about, especially on the DeFi side. And also, we talked about this a little bit, but like that self-sovereign identity where you can prove something about yourself without necessarily giving away that information. 
So like from an underwriting, like a lending, I, I was a commercial banker for 13 years at Frost Bank, which is right down the street over here. Um, and just like being able to have that privacy and prove that you have a certain amount of assets in a wallet address without having to sh say how much those assets are specifically or where that address is located, that's a huge benefit. And that's what, that's what we really need. Like time to finality is important, better UX and privacy and the ability to prove things about yourself without actually showing people what those things are. So those are kind of my thoughts there. Awesome. Uh, I'll echo that point. I mean, you know, I buy things. I don't want anyone to know about anything in my life. And, you know, if I buy a Starbucks cup, I don't want people knowing that I bought a Starbucks cup, okay? Uh, I am a little bit of a coffee snob too, so that's where that comes from. But just a little question before we head into some of, our, of the challenges associated with ZK. Do you think ZK will be used to fundamentally create new products and industries, or will it be used to supplement existing products and their current offerings? I think, um, I think both, for sure. I, um, honestly, I feel like there's so much work to be done around optimizing current industries. I think we can apply ZK to healthcare, gaming, IoT, pretty much anything where you can benefit from privately and securely sharing data between maybe two untrusted parties, I feel like you know, that space could eventually be you know, optimized with ZKPs. So I think that's definitely where I think is a great starting point. I think that's a ton of work to do there. And I absolutely do think there's new industries that can be created from it. Um, I don't have any ideas there, to be quite honest with you, like completely new industries, but I'm sure there are plenty. Definitely. Um, so now moving on to where you think some of the roadblocks and bottlenecks that need to be solved before Zika can really take off for the next billion users or so. I'll tackle, I'll tackle this one first, sorry. <laughs> Cut you off. Um, I think kind of like piggybacking off of um, what he was talking about, there's a bit of an incentive issue. And I think, you know, we talked about like, ZK really started in the 1980s, but like, why wasn't it built? Why wasn't this commercialized? Like, why wasn't the funding there? Whatever it is. And I think a, a big part of that is incentives. Like, there wasn't a group of people who had like a monetary reason or like skin in the game or like an ethical reason to like, to like push it forward. But I think the adoption of like ZK, just like any technology, is, is kind of depend on the incentives. So for a, a company that, you know, you can, read between the lines, but like think of like a big tech company that wants a lot of data, like they're not gonna actually push this thing forward, they're actually going to fight against it in some ways. And, and whether that's you know with lobbying or um, something more straightforward just by not you know using the technology or just buying it and and and, and never using it. Um, so I think like what you're gonna see is you know outside of the hardware acceleration and outside of like the industry kind of like standardizing on certain things or like pulling together better language models for web two developers, like whatever it is, there's always gonna be this incentive question where like the current incumbent actually doesn't want to implement always and sometimes they want a stifle innovation. So I, I, I think what we're gonna see is, is kind of like that balance, but ultimately like human humans progress and I think technology that is more powerful and more performant is gonna win out. So I think it's like this element, but I do think it'll take longer than people expect and it'll be kind of surprising companies and surprising individuals that actually rise above, you know, some of the legacy systems, legacy companies. Yeah, um, kind of on the technical side of that, I think one of the big roadblocks right now is just the basic fact of proof generation time. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, so just funding research and making sure that, you know, that gets as efficient as possible. I think another thing that will help a lot is with a lot of these cryptographic primitives, you know, you want to have to think about it as little as possible, especially if you're talking about bringing in huge numbers of developers, right? You know, when you're connecting to a website, you don't want to have to think about whatever protocol they're using. You just want to like look at the little lock in your browser and think, check. Um, and you kind of want to make that same type of experience for developers. So a lot of these, uh, you know, I'll go back to what we were talking about earlier with developing frameworks that make, you know, ZK something you can almost attach on at the end. Uh, you know, as easy to use as possible, I think we'll just allow an explosion of innovation. Oh yeah, I was also gonna say that um, I think just like just resources in general is, is great. Like when I talk to people who are not in crypto in Web3 and they ask me like, 
where can I go to learn more about this? But it, everything changes so quickly, just in the crypto space in general, especially on the ZK side. So it's like, it's like, where do I go to find this information? I'm like, man, you got to get on Twitter and listen to podcasts, right? And that, that's like not the best UX for a dev either, right? Like you just got to try to stay up to date all the time, like 24-7. Yeah. Um, that's tough to do. But I think, you know, also like the, like you were talking about computational complexity and also like the resources that it takes to, to, to do those uh, computations as well. I think we've made like decades of progress like in the past three years on that from like a, a ZKP perspective and, but you know, like hardware costs are also like something to consider. Perfect. And you know, we touched on this a little bit, education, better frameworks, better tooling. But what else is needed to kind of bridge the gap between the relatively small amount of ZK app developers to, you know, total Web3 developers? You know, frankly, you know, Web3 developers to total web developers and Web2 as well. How can we bridge that gap a little bit better? I think one thing that can help a lot, you know, a lot of times being really excited about this new tech we spend a ton of time talking about ZK and a ton, a ton of time talking about Web3. Um, but you know, like for instance, my parents don't really have any concept of how much of their data is being tracked online. You know, trying to describe to my mom why she needs a ZK proof to log into her email is gonna be like a long conversation. And one of the things that really is needed there is just an educational resource on what's happening in Web2 right now and making it easier for people to understand and see, you know, all these things are getting stored by someone. You know, anything you're using here, not just like, wow, how is this free? You know, your information is being sold. And I, I think those types of educational purposes to help people see what the problem is are just as important, um, you know, as teaching people about the solutions. Yeah, no, I, I completely echo all of that. Um, I think to even go farther there, I think just educating on ZK with consumers is really, really important because without that consumer education, we also need to push from their side as well because, um, you know, to show how important the technology really is. I think another really interesting aspect is um, we're still really early in terms of the use cases of ZKPs and where it's going to be on the application layer. And I think once a lot of these um, ZK businesses start generating, generating more revenue and um, you know, there becomes actually a larger demand for even more ZK developers, I think people will naturally just um, you know, shift to that equilibrium of supply and demand for ZK developers and they'll specialize. And of course, all of this comes with the fact that the general tech stack is gonna be more advanced, right? More advanced libraries, tooling, um, just really just a battle hardened entire dev stack. So I'm really excited for that. Awesome. I mean, you know, Ben, it's, it's funny. Uh, I tried explaining what is your knowledge proof to my mom and dad. You know, my dad's an MIT grad, so he's, you know, quite intelligent. Uh, over their head, maybe that's on me. Uh, but I do think this is something that is, you know, a fairly complex topic. But I think a lot of high-end technology kind of goes the same way, where you have, you know, people who are very deep into it, and eventually it just becomes a back-end technology that nobody even knows that it's called zero knowledge. It's just there. Uh, you know, for example, I take airplanes. I have no idea how an airplane works. <laughs> um, but you know, my last question before opening it up to the audience just relates to privacy and using zero knowledge. How can we manage around you know, regulatory concerns when it relates to zero knowledge and compliance? Yeah, I think a really interesting framework that was proposed was selective de-anonymization. I think that's definitely the most reasonable one at the moment where you have you know, um, deposit screening, um, withdrawal screening, and again, the selective de-anonymization, which essentially allows you know, federal regulators or law enforcement to um, de-anonymize somebody if there is reasonable basis for any kind of uh, money laundering or what have you. Um, now, of course, there's still questions around what that mechanism would look like. Who's going to control the keys? Who's actually going to let them de-anonymize? I think it's a, a very interesting um, aspect of open research where we can actually have compliant crypto privacy. So I'm definitely excited about that. Cool, perfect. Any final points before we open it up to questions? All right, let's, uh, anyone raise your hand? Yeah, I'm really interested in the hardware requirements on GoForward Basic. 
hardware requirements on a go-forward basis. You know, you have a finance industry which has half a million to, to 500,000 to a million transactions per second right now. And you're talking about running a ZK proof on a, on a web browser, but not if it's a 10 gigabyte data set or you're verifying a bunch of compute technology. So there's, I think, I'm just curious with you guys about what do you think needs to happen from the hardware perspective to be able to execute on a vision where people could be verifying large data sets, people could be verifying off off-chain compute, people need to do hundreds of thousands of transactions a second to compete with the finance industry, let alone healthcare and all those others. So I'm just curious, like, where do you think we, is this a relevant, where do you think we're going, what are the implications here? Thanks. Uh, touch on that a bit. Uh, hardware isn't, you know, my background, but like thinking about this some, one of the main trade-offs you wind up here is between the cost of developing and manufacturing hardware and the rapid pace of development in the field that we've been talking about. So I think from a hardware developer perspective, you really need to isolate what the primitives are, right? You need to think about, you know, typically we've been working with smaller integers than you do in the crypto space. So increasing like the word size, thinking about what types of primitives cryptographically are really interesting. Uh, you know, if you had somebody who is some really fast specialized miner that you know used whatever ASIC to get that done fast. They just needed like a circuit that ran SHA. But now you know you need a circuit that is going to be able to do all types of whatever elliptic curve cryptography is involved. You know you might need to be able to do some FFTs. That's something that you see a lot um, that could probably go into hardware. I think one of the other things that will take a lot of time to really figure out is what the memory to compute trade-offs are. You're starting to see some methods that are looking around, uh, you know, essentially using table lookups to get around this proof generation time and to make proofs smaller. And you wind up uh, shifting more and more of the compute time into just memory accesses. And that's going to be just a whole different ballgame for hardware. Uh, it's kind of something you've already seen in the HPC industry or AI, and you know, now it's coming to ZK. So I think at the end of the day, just really focusing at the basic building blocks is going to be what gets people there. Yeah, and, and just to touch on that last point you had, which was related to hardware, but to kind of compete with like the legacy systems, I think is, is what you're kind of saying. It's kind of a, a, a niche example, but if you just think about like financial execution, right? Like time to Chicago to New York is like five milliseconds or something, right? Like you're using fiber optic cables and like a year later those are extinct and now people are using like microwaves, right? So that's like something that crypto is really going to struggle to compete with if it's like this global database of all these nodes keeping each other in balance. But on the other side of that, there's like a novelty that there's a reason people use Ethereum, which has 12 second block times and they transact on there even when Coinbase is much, much faster, right? And much closer to a legacy system because it's just one centralized server. So the kind of the, the like optimistic side is like we don't actually have to be necessarily as performant as every legacy system because we're adding some novel features that are, are very, very distinct. So if you, th if you just, you know, taking the financial example further, if you think about like FX trading, like there's a lot of counterparty risk with that. Whereas if you use like uh, uh, Ethereum to do, you know, FX trading, your counterparty risk is pretty much instantaneous. Like there's a reorg risk on Ethereum right now, but it's, it's a lot less than like T plus two settlement. So taking that further, like adding in privacy, like that's a novel feature of these systems. So I think with, you know, like an emerging market, if you grasp onto some like power users who really, really love this novelty and this product, you don't necessarily always have to compete with the legacy system or beat them at their own game. You want to get, you know, as close to, as possible to be convenient but I don't think you actually have to be like one for one as performant. Yeah, last question. Um. Yeah, so I wanted to pull out a, a couple of different threads. One is the stuff you just said about how if you've got some new feature, if you've got some thing that actually offers people stuff they couldn't get, then they'll get excited. They will pay, in your example, a, a performance price, but you know, maybe a monetary price. They will pay something for good stuff. but. One of you, I think, said, you know, when, when we get more revenue into, into ZK companies, then we'll get more developers doing stuff. And I'm like, yeah, maybe, but telling people that you should pay more money for this thing so we can get it started uh, often isn't a seller. Whereas if you say, hey, 
if we figure out how we can just mass produce this thing, you know, like SIM cards or, or RFID cards that people use for paying or getting into their hotel rooms, you know, why are they everywhere? Because they cost effectively nothing. Right? So, so what is the economics that drives mass adoption? What's the economics that takes this stuff into widespread application that brings revenue, that brings developers, that builds that virtuous cycle? Um, yeah, I think again, it's it's just incentives. Like like early blockchain developer, like why are they doing this? They probably were like reading, you know, the cypherpunk manifesto, right? Like they're in deep, and and they were there for ideological reasons. And now, like maybe some of the latecomers are here more financial than um, necessarily ethical reasons, but still a lot a lot of ethical reasons. But I think for like you know your average web two Google developer, whoever to join crypto. Um, it, the revenue driver really has to come from the application, right? So if we get more performant, like proving systems, now we can build better applications that can actually compete with like the current crypto applications. And then once those things are actually generating revenue, it's a really easy sell to the developer to come in and be like, okay, we actually have users, we actually have an application, build our front end for us. And, and then that guy can come over. But when we're still in this world where proof generation is really slow, where the system doesn't really work, and you have to think about, you know, like, like um, Ben talked about like all these different systems, I think, or all these different parts of the system, I think it's gonna be harder to get them onboarded. So I, I think the revenue stack really flows from the user, but to do that first, you have to get the infrastructure to be close to as competitive as possible. Yeah, I'll just add one point to that. I think the demand is already there and people are building to get ready for that massive network effect. I think it's kind of been clear that we're not ready to onboard billions of users. So there have been significant advances in ZKVMs, uh, in new layer ones like Mina, Alio, and some other really cool projects out there. It's getting developers on board, uh, giving them the right incentives and the right opportunity to make great projects that will be on platforms that hopefully maintain the majority of share for crypto. That's just uh, my last point here, but anyone else? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll follow on to that. I think. Um, all the work we're doing right now, I think it's important to understand it's super foundational. Um, it's, I almost look at it partially R&D, if you will, because um, you look at the amount of work that we've done in the past one or two years alone in terms of the bounds we've made in cryptography and in hardware acceleration, I can only imagine where it'd be in two or three years where I think we'd be much closer in terms of performance to Web2 systems, but with all the rich features and functionalities that you know, Ethereum provides with decentralization, privacy, trustlessness, autonomy. Um, and of course, that's an assumption. I do think people will, there will be a demand for that. And uh, I think that's what I'm willing to bet on. And uh, I'll also say, you know, comparing to the traditional financial system, like I do talk to a lot of my, my friends who you know, I grew up with in my early career at, at the bank. And, you know, they say like, what well, you know, why would I use decentralized finance? And like, if you live in the United States or like you live in a Western country where you have a very established and secure financial system, you don't really have that need to use these quite yet. But there are like, there are so many people in the world who don't live in the US, like it's crazy that people don't live here, right? And, uh, but in, and they're unbanked. And that could be because, you know, there's just like, regulatory restrictions on who can be banked in that specific, uh, you know, geographical region, or they just don't, it's just like the distance to a bank is too far. And it's so much easier to get someone internet access than it is for them to be banked at a bank. There's so many countries that don't even just like, there's people in countries that just don't have IDs and you need IDs to like open up a bank account. So, and that's, that's, that's really where the value is, like in the permissionless and the inclusiveness of this global, this new global financial system that we are building. Does it need to scale? Yes. Does it need more privacy? Yes. We need, those demands are there, and that's what we're helping to bring with building, you know, using this new ZK tech. So, those are my final thoughts. Awesome. Uh, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Great question. Uh, thank you everyone so much for being here and listening to this panel. And so let's do our next uh, fireside chat. It's how to launch a ZK business. Um, I'd like to welcome Rachel Wolfson, journalist and host of Web3 Deep Dives podcast, and June Kim, board member at MENA Foundation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, big thanks to Mina for hosting this event. I think it's super important for education around zero knowledge proofs. 
Um, again, my name is Rachel. I'm interviewing June today. He is the general counsel and board member of MENA Foundation. Um, and we're going to be talking about zero knowledge businesses. June, before we get started, if you could just maybe briefly introduce yourself, explain your role at MENA Foundation, and then we can go into some questions. Sounds good. Um, thanks, guys. So at MENA Foundation, I'm a board member, and I was general counsel, but I've transitioned to start a ZKF business. Um, I'm not able to sort of publicly disclose the name of it just yet, but it's a real business, and it's talking to a lot of Web2 companies about potentially using MENA's technology to create zero-knowledge proofs and have that be used in their revenue model. So that was exciting. Um, I also teach at Cornell Tech. Uh, the course is called Blockchain Business and Law, and uh, happy to be here. Cool. So June, we're talking about zero-knowledge proof businesses or zero-knowledge businesses. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so this is like such a good question, and it probably will take the rest of the meeting to unpack. Um, the, the way I think about it, two, two sort of questions. First is, are you building a product that is ZK? Or are you enhancing another business using ZK technology? I think those are the two big sort of fork and, and you sort of have to determine, you know, what, what is the product that you're building and how is it contributing to, uh, you know, a particular business model. And then separately on the side, um, the question is also market cap, right? Are you competing within the $1.2 trillion crypto market cap or are you looking to expand that pie um, into an area that's not currently covered by the market cap? And specifically the first type of business where you're creating a product, you're going out and working with other companies or acquiring users, one might argue that you're pushing the boundaries of the, the crypto um, market cap. So that's probably like where I would start as a canvas matter. And then it's about, you know, what sort of value are you adding to the businesses? Got it. So speaking of adding value to businesses, can you kind of explain that a little bit more in terms of how zero knowledge is, zero knowledge proofs are adding value <laughs> to business models? Yeah, I think there is a big, uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about it in Web2 context for the most part. Um, there's a big gap in my experience between the cool idea that CK represents and departments of companies that need to use them, right? So if you go up to, let's say, Nike or Adidas and say, hey, we could create zero knowledge proofs for you, they're most likely going to say, this is really cool, but we don't know how to incorporate this into, um, like, how do we hire you as a vendor? You know, like, wh what's the bottom line that you, you guys are helping me save? So those are sort of the distances that I found myself being challenged to overcome for the product that I'm building for this business. And I wonder if a lot of the people in this space, whether you're building on Mina or other chains, have to overcome that barrier if your audience is not specifically Web3, right? So that's kind of how I think about it. And that mismatch of almost like understanding and ap application of ZK is something that I think is a competitive advantage if some business figures that out. Right. Let's take a step back. And I know we've probably already discussed this during these sessions, but Zero, can you just explain what a zero knowledge proof is, I guess, and, and just relate that to a to business perspective? Yeah, and I'll tell you um, when business starts, like when, when, you, when you start losing the business, right? So zero knowledge is very simple to describe. Everybody here knows it. It's just being able to prove something without showing the underlying data. Everybody understands that. Um, okay, what is a ZK snark? Uh, they're gone. Right, like you could try to explain the difference between snark and stark, the recursive nature of you know Mina zk snark, and it's at that point where their eyes start rolling, and you basically have to translate either into a format that they understand, or how you're adding to sort of like the the bottom lines of their business or revenue models. So zero knowledge proof simply for me is a way to understand what their business and product needs are, and basically saying these proofs could help you with your user acquisition, user retention, um, 
you don't have to worry about GDPR, you don't have to worry about CCPA, you don't have to worry about HIPAA, you don't have to worry about FERPA, all these crazy data privacy laws that people are losing millions and millions of dollars on because they cannot convey the data from one database to another is actually an opportunity for, for people to come in and say zero knowledge proof could solve for that. So that is where I think most of my successful conversations have happened. Yeah, and it's interesting to point out that zero knowledge proof businesses, they're not just Web3 focused. Like you mentioned, they can apply to Web2 companies as well. And that's a really important point here. But are we seeing zero knowledge proofs being applied today in the real world for any companies? Are any of them actually leveraging this technology or is it something that they may leverage in the future? I absolutely think it's a matter of time before they leverage zero knowledge technology. It's just that when you talk to these like huge companies, they don't have a person there or a team that speaks blockchain. Oftentimes it's like rolled up to their PD team or their product team. They understand code, but they don't necessarily understand cryptography. So it boils down to almost explaining ZK to your mom or your dad. And that is what you gotta do, right? So for me, like when I'm explaining recursive ZK snark, which is so unique to Mina, and if you explain it the right way, it blows people's minds, right? The way I think about that is, okay, you think about it from steps one through five, and at the end of the five, you get a proof. And proof means this, okay? And now you could put that into another one through five, another one through five, another one through five, and you get a proof that is infinitely composable, could represent different databases, sub-databases, and imagine what you could do with that. It blows their mind, right? But if you read the definition of recursive ZK snark and expect them to understand that, uh, that conversation often doesn't go very far. And I will say one more thing, too. Uh, I, I focus on Web 2, but the application for Web 3 is just as strong, right? So in April 2023, the Treasury Department came out and said, DeFi is dangerous, don't use it. But there's a sentence in there that says, but guys, think about using zero knowledge proofs. You could prove that somebody is not a bad person um, without necessarily requiring or collecting personal information. A Treasury Department statement had that sentence in it saying we should really look into zero knowledge proofs. So that could really define and redefine the way we think about DeFi, um, tornado cash like risk, and I think that could add a lot of value. Yeah, I think that zero knowledge proofs enhance Web3 use cases for sure. But my question is, is there hesitation from these you know, DeFi applications to implement zero knowledge proofs in terms of, you know, would that take away from decentralization or any other elements that Web3 promises? That's a good question. And I think the sh like an easy answer is like it definitely could. Right, so if you're substituting a KYC service provider or onboarding process with another identity solution provider, all you're doing is really centralizing the database that collects personal information. So my question is, how do you have a decentralized KYC system that uses proof so that no one company or a group of people could all of a sudden wake up one day and say, you're a bad person? and therefore you should be blocked from access to all these different primitives or, or services. So I think zero knowledge proof could definitely help with the right product to centralize that, that, um, that, that, that sort of onboarding process. And I think that adds a lot of value to DeFi as a whole. Right, yeah, I'm just curious to know if there's like hesitation from companies to implement the technology um, if they're worried. But also another question I was wondering about um, in terms of regulations and laws, are there any regulations around zero knowledge proofs as of now? Because it seems like it could be such a revolutionary technology that there might be regulations around it moving forward. So how does that play out with companies wanting to implement it? I think regulation is your friend when it comes to zero knowledge. And I, uh, I'm general counsel, and this is probably the question I feel most comfortable answering. Um, in addition to like data privacy laws, a lot of companies cannot make as much money because of limitations around privacy laws. Ad tech, for instance. The biggest issue that ad tech faces right now 
is that they cannot send ads to you or to, to folks that haven't really collected personal information or received consents for. And when I describe the technology to the law firm that we hired, who has top 500 ad tech companies, and they said, well, you solved ad tech. Because if you can then basically have the other guy trust that you are who you say you are, we could send you an ad. And you could do maybe a revenue split on, on the ads. And he just kept going. But that is a way for you to sort of add value and increase the bottom line of the companies. Similarly, right, you can imagine a world where HIPAA, or the medical information privacy laws, which are probably the strongest form of pri privacy law in the United States, um, it's such a hassle for you to change your primary physician, right? And the hospital system here is so fragmented that if you go to one hospital, but you're traveling interstate, and you get injured and go to another hospital, they cannot talk to each other um, because your personal data is so sacred. But if you're able to basically carry around the proof or be able to communicate more freely, then to me, that is an opportunity for certain companies to say, hey, um, the firewalls that the hospitals built and insurance companies built, probably to make as much money as possible for them, we could break that. Uh, and we could do it in a way that's legal, uh, that is celebrated, and that empowers the users. So overall, you know, regulations are definitely your friend um, because your knowledge proof gets around it. I'm not sure necessarily if regulations are your friend when it comes to DeFi, because there is no regulations around DeFi in the United States at the moment. Um, I haven't really studied Mika, but if there's no regulation, you can't comply with it, right? But if you take a step back and, and you think like being shut down because Department of Justice thinks that you created a pool with a lot of Iranians or North Koreans, if that is a significant business risk to you, then you should absolutely consider promoting or adopting a zero knowledge proof based identity system that basically says you're not on the sanction list. Right? So it's just a good business decision, even though there's no regulation to comply. And interestingly enough, I do believe that there will be regulations in the future uh, in DeFi. And the steps like that, I think, help toward the right direction um, for, for those services. Right. It's kind of like with the rise of AI right now. I mean, AI has been around, but now everybody's talking about it. And regulations are up in the air around it. Um, but it's interesting because I was speaking with Evan yesterday for the Web3 Deep Dive podcast um, at the studio here in Austin, and he explained that zero knowledge proofs, they've been around for like 40 years. It's not a new technology, but right now we're seeing this kind of interest in zero knowledge proofs. Why do you think that's the case? Why are we seeing that now and why are companies starting to like gain interest in it? That That's a really interesting question. I think. Um, there's definitely a hype around certain subjects in blockchain and in any given year. And I think ZK is definitely having its moment now. I also think that all, almost all the big chains and companies are exploring ZK solutions to various problems. And interestingly enough, I think this concept of digital identity is really um, emerging as a topic du jour. And I think in all those instances, zero knowledge technology has a lot of value to add. So I wonder if it's a confluence of those um, different factors. But the problem, again, is it's, it's such a complicated technology. You know, how do you apply it? And how do you basically tell people you have to hire the company as a vendor? You have to allocate your engineering and money resources to building this together. And that's probably homework for all of us that want this technology to thrive. Right, and just based on that, do you have any additional advice that you can explain in terms of if a company wanted to implement zero knowledge proofs? Like, how would they go about that? Is it complicated from a technical perspective? How, you know, how do you explain that? I know you've touched on this already, but just any like pieces of advice that you would give? Yeah, um, I think starting with an idea is always a great idea, um, but there definitely has to be. A, Having gone through this for six months myself, there needs to be a layer and layer and layer of consideration that eventually creates your business idea. So the first layer is like, which technology are you using? Which protocol are you using? And um, I know my marketing team hasn't made me say this, but I think Bina's the best one, right? Because 
the, the recursive nature of the, the snark is something that you could easily sell and, and get people amazed by. Otherwise, you're just stuck with like a binary kind of representation of a fact, right? You're X or you're not X. And oftentimes that has a lot of limitation. But you should also do homework on what limitations exist for the protocol, right? You don't want to be in a position where like four months, five months into a deep discussion, you realize the protocol cannot do something at this moment. So those research needs to happen right away. Um, the second is not all cool ideas are good business ideas. So the best example of this is proof of age. Mm -hmm. People think it's amazing and you don't have to show your driver's license that has your address in it, right? Then everybody knows where you live when they're checking your age. The problem with this is the vendors and everybody who checks your ID is obligated by law to only check forms of ID that are approved by the government. So if you have a zero knowledge proof that says you're over 21, that's not gonna be accepted anywhere, right? So unless you could work with the government and have a zero knowledge proof be a representation of a government database, this cool idea may not be the best business idea. Um, and lastly, I think your business model should evolve with the business needs. So I remember one meeting I had with um, a huge company and we talked for an hour and my idea of what I think could be value add for the company completely changed in the middle of the conversation. And in fact, they proposed something that blew my mind. And I was like, actually, I think we could do that. And, and we sort of came to a solution that works together in a Web2 context. And to me, that is such a beautiful sort of way to approach this because oftentimes we don't know what they need, right? And, and we need to really learn that um, uh, through various meetings. So those are some, some tips, I think. Yeah, definitely. In terms of use cases for zero knowledge proofs in businesses, what would you say are the most um, likely ones to fit that need? Are they financial use cases, like businesses that are doing stuff with finance, or just any other use cases that really fit well with zero knowledge proofs? Because I'm sure you know it's not a one size fits all, but maybe it is, I don't know. Yeah, it's the, the one of the problems, in my opinion, of ZK is that like sky's the limit. So uh, some of the, the best use cases that are being talked about right now, it could be anything, but it's definitely, to me, it's in the digital identity space, membership space, finance space, in terms of like working with financial institutions on zero knowledge proof using financial transactions. They're very interested in that. Um, also, it's, it's interestingly in the government space. Um, if somebody could crack that, I think that would be amazing, right? Because what is more powerful than um, a zero knowledge proof relating to a database that is a source of truth, right? So if somebody could say like, oh yeah, like I, I live in Texas and I could create a proof of that, that'd be amazing. I also think medical space is something that I love I want people to really double down on, right? So like, if you go to a hospital, proof of insurance, you know, the proof that you don't have allergy, or there are so many things that you could communicate to not only physicians, but almost in like an emergency context, that's really cool to have. So I'm, I'm sure I didn't do it justice to all the, the different fields, but at least initially those, those seem good. Yeah, it's interesting because I think zero knowledge proofs can really enhance a number of businesses, as you mentioned. Um, but it's also interesting because it's not directly related to blockchain, correct? Like, and so I think that might also help drive mainstream adoption because sometimes regulators think of blockchain and they think of crypto and then they think of like FTX and like all these issues. So I think if we can just spread the word that zero knowledge proofs is a technology that can do all of these things and it doesn't have to be applied to blockchain and crypto, that can help drive mainstream adoption. For sure. Like these days, crypto is not a good word to throw around in like big BD meetings. Um, but actually, I, I want to take another side of that, which is um, inevitably somebody will ask, like somebody smart will ask, do I need blockchain for this? Because zero knowledge, as you said, is not necessarily blockchain. You could create a, a Merkle tree um, on internet uh, without necessarily using a blockchain. But then I think you're in a position to defend the blockchain use case because 
it's security, right? It's, it's all the benefits of a distributed ledger technology. And once you talk about that, you know, they really get it. So it's, it's been like 95% educational um, and 5% actual business discussion on a lot of these meetings. Um, but everybody that I talk to want to learn about zero knowledge and, and as much as possible. Right. So I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. But before I do that, June, do you have any final thoughts that you just want to add that I might have overlooked that you'd like to let everyone know about? Or should we open it up to questions? Yeah. One last thing I want to say is that it's really hard to do ZK business by yourself <laughs> or with just a team. Um, you need uh, like a support network. And I think Mina has a very good grant program and network of people that could connect you with somebody who knows somebody who could help you sort of really make it into a better idea. It takes an army to launch a successful ZK app business or ZK business. And um, you know, if you're interested in building on Mina, I encourage you to speak to our team members because they're there to help you to make sure you could save months of looking to find somebody or trying to find the solution. Yeah, and I want to add on to that. I did, as I mentioned, I did a great interview with Evan, the CEO of Mina Foundation, yesterday for the Web3 Deep Dive podcast. So for anybody interested in learning about zero knowledge proofs, we really actually break it down in very easy to understand language. So uh, that will air in like two weeks from today on the Web3 Deep Dive podcast. So everyone should also check that out as, as a resource. Um, and we have about five minutes left, so I just want to open it up to you guys for questions, if you have any questions for June or myself um, on zero knowledge proofs. Sure. So, so it might be more for you than for June even, but what about using zero knowledge as a way of uh, essentially combating fake news or being, being able to, to build a layer of trust over you know, journalism and a, a statement of facts, whether it's you know, political journalism where you don't want to reveal your sources, or whether it's scientific journalism where you want to actually you know, say, yeah, this science is good, it's based on this and this thing, and it actually is properly based there. Do you want to give a reflection on that as a... Was that for me? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, I'll let you start. Do you, do you want me to start? Yes. Um, I think that's a fascinating use case. I don't know how that would work. And I think maybe Evan has a better idea. Definitely encourage you to talk to him. But for, for me, like at least zero knowledge proof is a statement that you sort of belong in a database or an underlining data is true. So you could imagine a world where like a community verification or reputational sort of element comes in to create a proof that could really be trusted, right? So I think that infra along with being able to present that kind of proof would be powerful. And I'll add to that. So we did actually talk about that use case when I was speaking with Evan yesterday. And it's interesting because right now with the rise of AI, we're also seeing the rise of fake news. I mean, fake news has been around, but now AI is generating even more fake news. And Evan was saying, or at least I think he was saying, that zero knowledge proofs can combat that. Um, and so we do talk a little bit about that and how zero knowledge proofs can help with AI and, and all that fake news and other you know images that are fake being generated because zero knowledge proofs are a form of cryptography and cryptography is also you know doing that as well. Cryptography can combat AI and all of the fake stuff that it generates. So um, cool. Anyone else have any questions? Hey guys, just want to say thank you for uh, everything so far. I just wanted to. Uh, piggyback off that question. Um, a lot of the use cases so far um, seem to be more of like nice to have as opposed to this is a real problem that we're trying to solve for. I do think that in 10 years time, everything is going to be ZK-ish. But is there any pressing use cases that you guys think need to be solved today with ZK? I think like digital identity, as you mentioned, June, I think that's massive. Um, yeah, so, so two things. Actually, somebody said it. Um, so digital identity. So there's a study done by McKinsey um, a few months ago that says a country or a company that's able to harness digital identity correctly um, unlocks anywhere from 6 to 12% of additional GDP. 
And that is not only true for countries, but for companies. And you kind of want to be careful with digital identity and companies because you don't want to create like more meta, Apple, where they're the repository and control your information. But I think what's interesting is zero knowledge proof could be used to free your uh, digital identity from the grasps of companies that don't tell you what they use the data for. So I think there is a strong, and I do believe that there's going to be a eureka moment where people will wake up one day and say, like, I don't have privacy. Um, and you know my data is being misappropriated. So I think digital identity definitely is um, uh, a pressing matter. And depending on who you talk to, they'll agree with you. The other one um, is uh, definitely medical. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, how do I say this without sounding offensive? There's a lot of um, certain players in medical field that fully take advantage of patient data and make a lot of money off of it. <laughs> um, so if you're able to create a, a structure where that middleman could be removed, where the patient information could be selectively disclosed per consent with people that are interested in that data, then the owner of the data benefits from the data, which makes intuitive sense, right? So I think there's a lot of potential there as well. And I think DeFi needs zero knowledge more than ever right now. I think they're, at least in the United States, they're sort of faced with this existential, like should we KYC or should we not KYC? And I strongly believe that zero knowledge proof helps create like a middle of the road path for them to sleep at night while also not caving in and requiring every user to send their passport information. So, so yeah, those three. Yeah, it's interesting. It could be a case where zero knowledge proof kind of starts off with DeFi and then it goes into the mainstream once these applications, you know, once it's shown how useful it is, I guess. So we'll just see what happens. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if anybody else. So a lot of the uh, Web3 ZK companies are just startups that are just being made now. And then a lot of the Web2 companies you mentioned are already like big existing companies. Do you think that there will be room for more like Web2 ZK startups? Web2 ZK startups. Yes. And, and that is the company that I'm trying to, I'm trying my best to, to take off. Um, and then the reason why I think, I think it's much harder to do a Web2 ZK startup, but I think it's so much like more ambitious and cool personally because again going back to what I said you're expanding the market cap of crypto right 1.2 trillion is is not that big in in the global scale of things so if your company could all of a sudden work with web2 users who do not understand crypto to me you're also fighting for the industry and the adoption of the technology itself so so it's harder, but definitely noble uh, cause, in my opinion. Cool. Great. Well, I think that's about it. We're out of time. But June, if people want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Are you active on Twitter or Telegram or? Uh, yeah, uh, either way. OK. I'm happy to discord. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, June, and thank you so much, Rachel. You're going to stay on stage because we've got another panel starting in just a moment with you. We do have to do a little chair reorg. Um, I do want to say, too, that if you are interested in starting a ZK business, this lovely ZK Ignite program does literally provide that kind of help and information for you. So I'll say it again. Please check it out. Um, OK. OK, hi again. I'm not going to reintroduce myself, but um, I'm going to allow the panelists to introduce themselves. The name of this panel is Bridging Web 2 and Web 3 with Zero Knowledge Proofs. And we've got some great panelists here. So I'm going to start with Mikkel. Yeah. Uh, you can introduce yourself, and then we'll just go down. Yeah, well, hey. Um, I'm kind of. I'm an I'm Mikhail Komarov, uh, Nisha, whatever. Um, I'm Null Foundation founder. That's, that's what we do. Since this is a mini event, come on, hit me with that one question. OK, nobody. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what I expected. <laughs> that's what I expected. <laughs> I mean, 
Um, here goes the answer. Uh, Minda Foundation folks are evaluating it, so we're in progress. Hey, I'm John Woods. I'm the CTO at the Algorand Foundation. Um, and I've worked on Ethereum and Cardano as well professionally. And my background is kind of building software and, and applied cryptography, that kind of stuff. Hey, uh, I'm Phil Kelly. I'm the head of business development for O1 Labs. Um, O1 Labs is the company that launched an SDK last year that allows people to build zero knowledge proof applications um, without being cryptographers. So we'll tell you more about that later. Um, we're also big contributors towards the Mina code. To be, and then further back, my background is a mixture of banking and technology. Spent three years at Joe Rubin's company in the Ethereum world, so great to meet you all. Hi, everyone. I'm Todd. I'm CTO at Snickerdoodle Labs. Uh, Snickerdoodle Labs uh, is building a data marketplace protocol that allows um, end users to lease their data to brands and businesses, which I think will be very relevant to the ZKP conversation we'll have here today. Great. Um, before we get started with the questions, I want each of you to kind of define what a zero knowledge proof means in your mind. I, you know, I know that we've talked about this throughout all of the panels today, but let's just take a minute. I want to hear what you guys define as a zero knowledge proof. So Todd, do you want to start? If I have to, I'll start it. Okay. Um, you know, zero knowledge proof to me when I have to explain it to my mother or my father or something like that. Zero knowledge proof means I can convince you of something without, I mean, the way I explain it, I can convince you that something is absolutely a fact, you know, without having to, uh, without having to share a whole bunch of information. I can quickly convince you that something is absolutely true. You don't have to have a PhD. I give you something quick. Yeah, like, this is a, this is a true statement. Got it. Phil? So, number one, I can't believe we have to try and explain zero knowledge proofs in public. Uh, it's a tough one. Because <laughs> you kind of know it, but it's hard to explain. Um, but I'll try. Um, and actually, I wanted to start off by saying I think that the rise of ZK rollups and ZK infrastructure has kind of created an opportunity, but also a problem for us, because there's a big misperception out there about ZK. Um, and in general, people think it, you know, the main use case is something that allows chains to go faster and operate more cheaply, um, or bridges to be more secure. Um, and those are you know, amazingly powerful use cases, but they're also incredibly narrow. Um, and they keep the ZK of the infrastructure layer. So other than having a you know, faster, cheaper um, chain and uh, safer bridge, you don't really experience the power of ZK. So I'm going like, to you know, take a risk here um, and explain ZK or refer to ZK as code that proves itself. Um, it will prove its own execution. So to give you an example, um, I can send you some code written with ZK. Um, you can run it on your Mac. Um, you can put some data into it and send me a, a, a result of the data. And when I get that result, even though I haven't seen you running the code, I don't know if you changed it or not, I don't know if you, if you even ran it, I don't know whether you tampered. I can't show directly that you didn't tamper with the result, but I can trust all of that because it was written with ZK. So it's code that proves its own execution. Um, and I kind of like, like that example of you running some code on your Mac and then setting with your result and me trusting it. Um, because it takes us out of the infrastructure layer and helps us think about some of the kind of, I think, more exciting benefits of ZK. So um, some of the properties of this. It's a new way of engineering trust in the same way as blockchain is a new way of engineering trust. But it, I think it's more powerful. Um, so if you're running code on your, on your computer and you put data into it and you send me the result, number one, I didn't see the underlying data, so it achieves privacy. Like finally in the blockchain world um, or blockchain-related technology world, we've got privacy. Um, it also achieves succinctness. So you can run a calculation on your machine. You send me the results. You don't need to send me all the underlying data. Even if you trust me with it, even if it's, if it's not private, you don't send me all that. I don't, need to, I don't need to rework the calculation. I can just trust the result. So you get succinctness. Um, you can also get um, attestation or you know, proof of provenance of data. So I can't see where you're sourcing the data from that you're sending me, but a ZK routine can prove to me that you did it in a way that where I can trust the data. Um, so then two other quick ones. Um, you can achieve scalability um, and freedom from gas costs. So if we were going to do some of this stuff on chain, we'd incur high gas costs. Um, you can do that off chain. You can also have all of us do things off chain. 
roll it up, put it back on chain, and avoid gas costs. And then finally, you can escape data constraints. So, sorry, that's a long explanation, but hopefully that's helpful. You decided to leave nothing for us, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll do rank one constraint systems, and you can do quaps, right? Um, yeah, let's start with our arithmetic circuits. Um, no, I think, I think uh, there's nothing left to say, but I, what I would say is uh, pay attention in school, because who knew uh, when you were learning about polynomials that they were actually useful? That's what I would say. <laughs> All right, I'll take, I'll take a different take on this. It's basically about, you know, this whole like proof system thing is about like two things. First of all, it's like privacy because of the blinding factor. And the second thing is about compression. Compression of whatever, like whatever process, whatever description of whatever process you have is like whatever. The code, is it the code? Is it like compression of a data which like preserves the, which, which, which preserves the original data structure you have done this compression on top of? So. That's basically that's basically what it is about. So it's like all of these. It's like some fellows were talking about, like you know, business in this space. So all of this business from this in this space, they basically gather value from that compression, which this enables. You know, if you if 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 if, if you were supposed to like send more data before that, now you just compress it. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it's expensive. Yada yada. But well, kind of solved it. Uh, but anyway, so that's kind of that's kind of the thing. And uh, it's like all this privacy. It's like it's like privacy is like one use case, yes. But it's like the compression is a misconception of, of a misconception and misusage, which is like much more popular than it turned out to be much more popular than the privacy use case. But anyway, that's kind of you know, it's all about these two factors. Cool. Okay. All that makes perfect sense. Um, why should we start thinking about bridging Web two and Web three applications together using zero knowledge proofs, and how will this be achieved? And anyone can start. OK, I'll start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, it's Snickerdoodle Labs. I can tell you how we're approaching it. Um, like I said in the quick little blurb about Snickerdoodle Labs, we're, we're trying to enable you know, an unsophisticated and a non-technical non end user to lease data to, to brands and businesses. So like, monetize your own like search history, the kinds of things you're interested in, uh, purchase history, what kind of digital assets you own, that kind of stuff, right? Typically, uh, you know, status quo, right? You have, you have third party brokers like Google, or Facebook, like we were talking about in the previous panel. You don't, the end user doesn't get any monetization. You're, you're, you're the product um, and you're giving up the data in order to use these platforms for free. Um, well, if a user is going to lease data to a company, if I let the cat out of the bag, I can't really lease the data. The data starts to lose value. If I, if I give raw data to a brand or to a business, uh, I'm at that entity's mercy now. They can share that data around. I can't stop them. Um, well, we're leveraging zero knowledge proofs to where a user could, for instance, prove uh, to um, a business that I own, I own these NFTs, and I, in fact, own this many NFTs, and I own this much USDC. And I can prove it to you uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt, but you don't know which wallets are mine, and you have no idea who I am. Um, in that sense, it's a lease. I've, I've, uh, I've leased this information to you. It doesn't really do that brand any good to turn around and then farm that information out to somebody else because you can't tie that back to a natural person. So, you know, in the context of Snickerdoodle Labs and what we're trying to achieve, um, this, this, is, this is why we're using zero knowledge proofs and, and why we're bridging Web 2 and Web 3 data together with zero knowledge proofs to enable a non-technical end user to monetize their own data. Something that we might get into later in this conversation is, is usability of zero knowledge proofs. These are very technical, these are very technical things, right? People already complain about the usability of the Web 3 space. So now you're going to throw a new sophisticated technology on top of all of the other Web3 stuff, and it's still got to be usable. This is probably another thing we could talk about um, you know, later in the panel if, uh, if we get there. John, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So I don't, I don't really love the differentiator between Web 2 and Web 3. I know we're, like, we're all we're at the Algorand Foundation. We use that term, too. Um, but I'm, I, I kind of see really you know, just one, one realm of, of the digital age, right? And so I think. I, I'm, I don't like to kind of compartmentalize things as much as folks kind of, as the industry has tended, tended to do. What I think is really important is 
leveraging trustless systems. And so people expect now that they have, you know, pri they, they have a, an expectation of privacy. You know, even in my own family, people were surprised to hear that, like, if, if I were sent some Bitcoin to them or received some Bitcoin, that they, they, they were surprised to hear that I could see their balance. My friends were, you know. And so these technologies will allow us, as you've very, very uh, elegantly put, um, Todd, uh, they'll allow the uh, fundamentally the, the average user, the, the a normal person, uh, the infrastructure to 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 disclose just as much as they want to disclose, um, and also be able to have a a effectively an interface into Web3. And what, what I think when when we've really gotten to the point where we have zk infrastructure um, that. The user doesn't even realize that they're interacting with maybe, for example, a Web3 platform that is ensuring the veracity of, of the execution of some transaction, and they've executed that in a way that's protected their, their data, and they've only disclosed just enough uh, information. I think that that's just a huge win, and it's for me, it's approaching a utopia where we should have been. Uh, so much problems in Web2 have caused, uh, again, there I am using Web2, even though I said I don't like the term, but so many problems in traditional, uh, you know, uh, internet businesses have been caused by data breaches, and so that's the bit I'm kind of most excited about. It's kind of a, a roundabout answer, but yeah. Um, yeah, th I think those are both, gr both great answers. Um, I think, I mean, one thing to think about is that we thought of all these cool things to do in web. By the way, I also like the fact that, you know, we're sort of questioning the question because, um, or I like the fact in the question that there is no implied direction because I think, you know, you can bring web, web 2 stuff into Web 3 and vice versa, and you know those two worlds may not stay particularly different over time. Um, but to start off with the first of those, um, you know, we thought of all this cool stuff to do in, in Web3 um, with DeFi protocols, for example, um, but we're quite limited by data, and it's either the lack of availability of trusted data or it's the fact that we can't uh, submit data because it's not private and it's there permanently. Um, so I think the first thing is, ZK is going to allow us to bring a lot more data onto the chain and be used in um, uh, dApps in a way that, you know, A, just sources more data and B, allows privacy to be controlled. So there's like, you know, there's the obvious, obvious DeFi examples. Um, some of it could be, I think June was talking about something interesting earlier, which was this kind of halfway house for um, regulations where you might not want to KYC somebody, but you might want to prove beyond reasonable doubt that they are not resident in the US and therefore not subject to US regulations. Um, th you know, you could probably do un um, under, under collateralized credit. Um, it's beyond simply requiring somebody to provide a credit score because there's a lot of second order risks in, in Web3, but you, know, you can probably do that with um, off-chain credit scores or at least help it. Um, there's things that you can do to enrich your social life, your social media life um, in Web3. Yeah, people are starting to build an entity that has Web3 activities as the um, kind of signifiers of people's identity, but you can pull in Web2 stuff as well, like you know, details of somebody's Twitter account without doxing the Twitter account. Um, and you, so you can bring all of that in by proving um, or attesting to the provenance of data so people can trust it and then putting a, a privacy mask on it. Um, there's a ton of stuff we can talk about going the other direction as well, um, where the Web 2 world can be transformed by, by ZK that ties then back to some of the underlying capabilities and, and strengths that uh, Web 2 brings to it, but we'll probably talk about it later, I'm, guess, I'm guessing. For some, for some reason, folks have stuck with privacy use cases. I'm again going to go with the compression use case. So basically, it's like... All, all, all of this industry of ours is about is about performing some computation in the, in the non-trusted environment. So in the untrusted environment. So basically, all these clusters, all these protocols, they allow to 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 prove and to kind of rely in some non-frequent events in the untrusted environment. You know, because and and when you try to make them like more frequent, uh, you face you face the issues with like network connectivity, with like I don't know speed of light, whatever uh, things like this. Okay, so this kind of you know limits the frequency of events you can actually do in untrusted environments. And this whole thing about the proof systems, it kind of allows you to prove much more frequent events and rely on much more frequently happening data on much more frequently happening things. Uh, again, in untrusted environments, it's like a good example of that is like uh, proving the ML stuff or like proving like I don't know games, whatever. Uh, so that's like just perfect example of that. Uh, you know, just 
come up with an idea like of a frequent of, of a frequent events you would like to use like in the in, in the untrusted environment. So here we go. This is this is what it actually like enables. And that's again that's like compression use case. So that's what it is. Real quick on that. I really like how you brought up zero knowledge proofs as a compression technology. It's a very interesting way to look at it. In fact, if I was going to go back to grad school and do my PhD all over again, I would never sign up for that. But if I was, probably, probably what I would research is leveraging ZKPs as a compression technique for multi-agent system control. That's what I would do. So like self-driving cars that have to communicate with each other, robotic systems, these kinds of things, and having really robust multi-agent, physical multi-agent systems that are ZKP based. You get compression and safety at the same time. That's probably what I'd go back and study. I mean, that's what, that's what MENA does, right? You use a kind of recursive snark, don't you, for the chain? Um, yep, so they use uh, compression and recursive snarks in the chain itself. And then there are ways in which you can, you know, our, our SDK, uh, which is SnarkyJS, allows you to um, easily achieve recursion, which, you know, kind of has something of the same effect, yeah. I also like you pulling us back from privacy examples all the time because it is way overused. And, you know, we just did, I mean, a little while ago, we did a POC for, off-chain voting uh, that was rolled up using recursion and then verified on-chain. And we didn't put privacy in it. We did later because we sort of baked in some um, homomorphic encryption. But once we'd done it without privacy, I kind of liked it because it really stopped people being, just being distracted by privacy all the time. And it made them think about the um, succinctness and cost-saving benefits, which are yeah, way underrepresented. In the same time, a lot of folks will hate me for putting this in the, in, in, in the, compression, like, in the compression light. So. <laughs> In fact, that's you know probably the, the sorry we've gone off on our own, haven't we? we no, I, I like this you. is a great conversation. You guys just keep talking. Um, I was going to say in Algorand, like we, we don't have any zk tech direct, like directly on in the, in the chain really in the in the consensus algorithm. It's a VRF. You were which supposed is like, to do this. Huh? You were supposed to do this, as far as I remember. Yeah, yeah, we were supposed to. Yeah. There, there, there were some plans regarding that. What happened with it? Yeah, so <laughs> privacy is like coming. It's in it's in research to so looking at ways they can leverage zk to do to do privacy based smart contract execution. But right now. Really, the core of the consensus is the VRF, which is like an asymmetric uh, kind of HMAC. Um, but where we have used ZKP recently, um, just like what you're saying in compression, is to validate state proofs. So state proofs are this kind of uh, post-quantum thing we have. It's, uh, you finished like, it. Huh? You finished yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we now have a ZK circuit that can validate a state proof. And what is a state proof? It's really validating a Falcon signature, so a, a lattice based signature, right? Um, and that's quite heavy. So when we're interacting with chains like Ethereum, we issue the state proof. Ethereum, it's very expensive to, to computationally validate the Falcon uh, signature. And so we have a snark circuit that effectively allows us to express the Falcon proof which is in a non-post-quantum context then, because of course uh, you lose the post-quantum uh, immunity. Um, and so it's kind of like compression, right? We're, we're compressing the work required uh, using ZK to validate a post-quantum signature that was issued on a different chain. So it's just another example of what you're suggesting. Okay, cool. So now that we know all of the useful um, benefits of zero knowledge proofs for the most part, I'm sure you guys could talk for hours about it. <laughs> um, let's talk about the challenges with implementing this technology because it seems like an awesome technology, but what are the challenges with getting that up and running? I can go first. Uh, it's just really hard. You need, it's the intersection of many different disciplines and not just having, you don't just need a good coder, you don't just need a good researcher, you don't just need a good applied cryptographer. It's the, it's all of these people working together um, to implement it and it's just so tricky. That the, you know, there's very few people who fundamentally understand the mathematics enough to kind of draw it, take it on a whiteboard and, and explain it to people in a simple way. Um, and I just think it, it requires just so many areas of expertise and then when you want to roll to production, like it has been done with, m with many, many blockchains, like Zcash or you know, Monero or others that have used, uh, or Mina or others, you're taking, you know, it's a huge step to go from theory to uh, an environment, to an, a production environment where you're being attacked by anyone who can attack you. And so I just think it requires just super smart people and they're very expensive. That's mine. I'm going to jump in with, so I agree with that when you are hand rolling infrastructure. Um, that is absolutely true. It's you know, incredibly difficult and complex and there's uh, definitely team support. Um, where I'm going to disagree is for building ZK applications. Um, and that's what uh, so, so I think one of the challenges, is, is, is the, the theme is exactly right, which is that ZK technology um, at its core is you know, quite difficult and there's not that many cryptographers in the world currently who understand it. 
Um, on the other hand, I think there is potential, you know, ubiquitous demand for it. I think over time, as somebody said in the previous, or something in the audience said, you know, we'll see ZK technology used all over the place, including things that are entirely categorized as Web2. So, like, very little cryptography, massive demand, um, and the way in which you need to bridge that gap is by having SDKs, you know, shilling myself here, F SDKs that allow you to, allow a regular developer to build a ZK app without cryptography expertise. And so that's what we've been focusing on over the last you know, couple of years. We've got our SDK launched. It's built with TypeScript libraries. So um, inherits the ability to use TypeScript toolings, high level language. You can build stuff in, in TypeScript. It compiles down. So all the stuff you did cryptographers uh, for happens automatically, or automatically, and it compiles down to a ZK application. It's got WASM in it, so it'll run in somebody's browser. So that's what I hope is you know, an important step forward in allowing um, it to be usable and overcoming that kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. um, the, other th the other challenge, I think, though, is you know, we talked about data in the, on the last topic and you know, like sources of data from Web 2 to Web 3. There's still some challenges in getting that done. And so, again, you know, shameless shill for ourselves. Um, we're working on something called a ZK Oracle that will allow you to have a witness in a, in a TLS session. So, you know, you're talking to your bank within a TLS session today. You trust what you can see. They trust, you know, it's you. A third party has to rely on you to represent that data externally. Um, we and some other companies are working on putting a TLS-based witness in that session to allow data to be externalized in a way that is trusted because you've got this third party you know, robot essentially attesting to it and then putting it through a ZK filter so that you only show what you want to show and therefore providing more data for the you know, emerging ZK world. It's an excellent point. I just like you're building the libsodium of zk, right? You're basically building a library that's it's libsodium, of course, a library for standard cryptography. But, but people don't know how elliptic curve crypto works at its heart. Exactly. The scalar multiplication, the Montgomery ladders, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Whereas, you know, where, 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 and then when you use libsodium, it's very easy, right, to stay on track. And I think that's what what your product is trying to do, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, you, you should not have to be a cryptographer to use our, our product, and it should mm -hmm. be able to generate zk code for you. But, and I think even beyond that, though, I mean, you know, this is not shilling ourselves, but there's an opportunity for everybody out there. Um, like any other area of new technology, the more that everybody can access pre-built components, the better. So, you know, everybody doesn't have to build their own uh, privacy-preserving identity widget. We should have widgets out there that do that, that prove inclusion in a group without identifying you. There's a whole market out there for people to build um, developer tooling. Did you guys want to add anything to that? Or? I'll just jump in. I mean, I'll just kind of second what Phil was saying. You need, you need high quality, audited, um, easy to use libraries like SnarkyJS and the things that um, Mina Protocol is building. And it, needs, and it needs good documentation so that somebody coming out of a boot camp can build apps with it. That's what you need. It's like, you know, uh, you were talking about like how hard it is to develop these things and, th and yada yada. And well, okay, I do agree with this. Kind of, kind of like, you know, spent significant amount of time like just crafting you know some <laughs> circuits uh, just a lot of them and uh, that was a pain in the ass just like Phil taking advantage of like Minas Narkic to talk about that it's not a problem anymore I'm gonna take an advantage and, and to tell that it's not a problem anymore you can just compile CPP or Rust and you'll get it generated <laughs> so you kind of you kind of chose the way to do it the hard way yourself <laughs> Well, this is, this is, you know, uh, our founder, Silvio, actually was co-inventor of Zero Knowledge Proofs. So we like to do it from, from first principles. Yeah, okay. I don't like to use our libraries. You've got to, you know, roll it yourself. <laughs> this is exactly, this is, this is what happens with, happens with every new technology space. We're so into it that we talk about it all the time, you know, in as complex a way as possible. And what we need is for people to get abstracted from that and regular developers to start building things, which they can. They can already. We, we actually... So we're, you know, we're working with some people who are using SnarkyJS to build Zeek applications, you know, admittedly at the POC level often. Um, but you know, with the right amount of help from one of our experts, we've seen POCs built in the like, you know, 20 to 30 hour range. So. Yeah, I mean, my question is, there's so much complexity around zero knowledge proofs. And it's such a revolutionary technology, but given the complexity, do you guys think that mainstream businesses or Web2 or traditional companies are going to want to implement it into their business models because it's so complicated? I mean, 
they could technically look at things that are not zero knowledge proofs for privacy and do that. Like for instance, the UPIC thing, I think that's what, call, what it's called with banks and you can give the random bank account number to companies and they can pay you that way without knowing your actual bank account number. So why would companies want to implement zero knowledge proofs when they have other things that are less complicated and probably less expensive? I mean, eventually, it's going to be considered negligence not to have ZKP-based security. I mean, it, it'd be like a website now that doesn't have HTTPS, and you get the warning when you go to a website. It's like, this is not a secure site. It's going to be like that. You're, you're not going to have a choice. You're going to have to adopt security models based on ZKPs, because otherwise, you're going to be considered a negligent design. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, we... We always have regulation coming up on these panels as an inhibitor of ZKP usage, and I think you know for some use cases it will be in the short term. But I completely agree. I, I was thinking earlier, you know, ZK is probably going to get the same kind of treatment as um, you know HIPAA has provided to healthcare data. You're going to have to use ZKP where there's no reason to expose somebody's data, where there's potential security issues. It ought to be part of regulations, not prevented by it. I think in the simplest way, it'll be there's certain business applications or business processes that are more elegantly implemented in, in ZKPs than would be with traditional cryptographic primitives. Uh, you know, we, of course, we can encrypt data between people and all that kind of stuff, and it's fairly well understood at this point. But there will be cases where, you know, to deliver a, a, an impactful a, a product that a consumer really wants to use, like features that you want to deliver for your end user, you'll need to leverage uh, ZKPs. Again, I'm the only one standing on the compression side. Some things, some things are simply not possible for like more traditional companies to be implemented without, uh, without making a player to prove high frequency events. With without, again, I'm standing for like games in year, like something like this, for example. That's like you know, you're, it's, it's like you were asking why would they want to, why would they want to implement it? The the answer is because they want to earn, and that's not possible without this for them. That's, that's the answer. Right, but like, what's the next step that's needed in order to see that adoption? Because right now we're doing POCs in the Web3 space, right? Like in the crypto blockchain space. How can we start seeing POCs in traditional financial business models? Like, how can we get there? So I don't know that it's going to be traditional financial business models, although there's huge potential utility there. But I, you know, in the same way as we always gravitate towards talking about privacy, we do tend to gravitate towards talking about financial services. But I think there's some great use cases outside of that. Um, and there are actually, I mean, when we talk about what's going to be a catalyst to jumpstart mass adoption, I think it'll only take a couple of really big companies to you know, do something meaningful we'll for the ZK to make others take notice. And we don't discuss this enough, but there are some big companies that are already starting to look at ZK. Um, so in the launch program for our SDK, um, though, as, as well as, as um, a number of you know, great partners, there was uh, Brave Browser. Um, and then if you look at Cloudflare's website, they say that they're using ZKPs for proof of personhood, um, which I think is probably for anti-spam. So I think we'll get some breakthroughs outside of financial services, um, and then that will kind of kickstart the market in general. Cool. Um, so the technology has matured a lot over the years. It's not a new technology, as Evan mentioned to me in our interview. It's been around for about 40 years. How do you guys see zero knowledge proof technology maturing as time goes on? Like, have we reached the point where it's matured fully? Or do you think it's going to keep advancing? And if so, how will it advance? I know, yeah, I, I saw the earlier talk, and, and, and I heard the statement that, ah, oh, it's 40 years old. That's not very old in, in, in math. 40 years old is not very old. I mean, my background is simulation science. So I did you know, CFD, computational fluid dynamics, computational structural dynamics. Well, the math, the, the theory for that goes back 100 years or more. And just 30 years ago, people would have thought you were crazy if you said that you were going to use an, an, an industrial application. You're going to design naval architecture, bridges, whatever, with computational fluid or computational structural dynamics. You've got to, you got to uh, build physical prototypes. Now you're considered crazy if you don't simulate it first. But that, you know, there's a 100-year gap there. So 40 years is not that old, is my point, number one. Uh, so, so 10, 
10 more years, 20 more years uh, on the life cycle of a mathematical technology, this is, this is a very short time scale. It just takes time. 100%. I think, um, I mean, maybe two things for me. Uh, one of them's a little bit out there and the other one's a bit more uh, reasonable. Uh, I, th I, I think, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm certainly not an expert level uh, in ZKP the way you guys would be, but I think um, more efficient in terms of computational memory resources, uh, memory resource uh, ZKPs without a trusted setup is, is important. And I know that there's been loads of advancement in that, um, Starks and other things. Um, but I think that that's somewhere we're going to see. So we'll have, I think, um, more efficient ZKPs. So they don't take as much computational resource or as much memory to, to, to verify or to, val or to, to prove. Um, and the second thing is potentially uh, more work in post-quantum uh, uh, ZKPs. And again, I know quantum computers have been looming for forever, like the boogeyman that never comes. But again, if you look at some of the advances from you know serious companies like Google and IBM and others, um, they're starting to look at these quantum algorithms quite a lot more seriously. And I think eventually, uh, you know, things like if you look at NIST as well, they've been standardizing this stuff. We'll probably need to move to a post-quantum uh, ZKP, I would say. I'd say I'd say a lot, it all depends about it. It all depends on the use cases. I mean, if the use cases will be found for something new for this, well, okay, it's it's going to evolve. I mean, it's like it's not it's not like something which will be pushed forward without a need. So it's all about it's all about the need. For example, like again, uh, five seven maybe years ago, it's like things with, it's like things kicked off with like Zcash and things like that, and we have seen literally nothing for like maybe a couple of years after that. Because uh, I mean, there was literally no need in that, and then everybody was like, "Okay, well, we got like a new automatization way to do this whole this whole thing." I don't know if Ariel is around. Ariel's not around. Anyway, um, so then we were like, "Okay, well, we can see like a new automatization way to do things," and uh, okay, this allows us, you know, to, to compute more, to prove, to prove more, to do all the things more, and uh, this was literally there because of like because of like use cases to prove because of the use cases to prove like more privacy like for Zcash stuff and all the other things like more cheaply because there was a need for that. So again guys let's just find a use case and it will it will go whatever it needs to go. Um, and I'll just make one additional comment. So I think those are really great points on the sort of long term tra trajectory. Um, I think in the short term, um, there's been amazing progress the last couple of years, mostly motivated by, motivated by the fact that you know, a, a use case has been proven in general in blockchain. So we've, for example, you know, done away, at least in our stuff, with the need for a trusted setup. Recursion is easy. Er, um, um, I think there's now quite a focus on performance. And I'm actually really optimistic that performance challenges are going to be, um, you know, have to make a lot of progress against those quickly. Just, you know, it just hasn't been a focus. We've been trying to work on features and functions and basic capabilities. Um, there'll be a big focus on now on performance. So I think we'll, we'll see huge improvements there. Um, we're focusing also on flexibility in relation to being able to handle multiple cryptography schemes um, for different signature forms uh, and different elliptical curves. So I think that will be. Um, a helpful advance in the next, you know, probably very soon, you know, year or two for sure. Uh, we've been working on foreign field arithmetization. So, yeah, I think there's uh, um, going to be progress on both those fronts in the short term. Definitely. Before I open it up to the audience for questions, let's just end on some final thoughts. If I didn't cover something that you guys wanted to add to the panel, please do so um, before I open it up to questions. If there's something else, John, do you want to? No, I think you did great. Add any points, anyone? Misha? No? We didn't talk much about the reverse direction of you know Web 3 and ZK transforming Web 2. And I, I really like some of the, you know, when we talk about what's going to cause adoption, there's some really big issues in the world at the moment that I think are going to cause everybody to take ZK more seriously or, or you know, speed up adoption. There's a huge issue with trust. Um, there was reference earlier to, you know, ML models, how do we know how they're operating when we can't see them? Twitter, uh, Twitter published its um, recommendation model, but we don't know whether they're running it every day. Um, and putting that in Zika app would allow you to prove that. We don't know the source of images because AI is so good. You know, ZK could potentially allow you to track the provenance of images. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more we could probably discuss if we had time in the, in the Web2 world. Yeah, I think a lot of Web3 is going to drive the adoption for traditional business models because we're applying that now in Web3. And once you know these companies see how efficient the technology is, they'll want in on it. But I do think that we need to solve the technical and expense challenges that come with implementing the technology in order for it to go mainstream. So those are my thoughts. 
Cool. So does anybody have any questions? We have five minutes, and I'm sure our panelists are happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. So does anyone have any questions for the panelists? Um, hello. Thanks, guys. It was a great talk. I just have um, one question on not particularly compression, which was really interesting bringing up, but for privacy with ZK, were there any pieces of data that you realized that from sharing from either users and companies or companies companies that don't exactly fit in a ZK model and not exactly like, what I mean is knowing whether it's true or false isn't good enough, where you actually do need to share the data. What are some of those pieces of data that you've seen that it won't work and you actually do need to reveal what it is? It's a great question. Uh, we've had a lot of use cases when, when, when just traditional, when in just a traditional proof generation, like we have, we have several, we had several use cases on the proof market, like where, where just a traditional proof generation wasn't a fit, because it was required for folks to disclose their data, for to disclose their data, and to delegate that to provers for them to be able to generate the, to, to generate the proof from that. So that was like the case when, when it was like not possible to use that, you know, in a traditional model. Well, the answer to the answer to your question is basically, I don't know if there are like FHE folks in here, FHE folks, that's what it is, that's that's the answer to it, that's the answer to what you want. And basically it's, you know, it's not performant enough yet, it's not like theoretically ready for like, you know, for usage and production yet, but again, like folks are experimenting, we're experimenting with that, so that's the answer to your question. I mean, it's like just FHE encrypted data, that's what it is. We're experimenting. We're experimenting on the proof generation over FHG encrypted data, so folks would, wouldn't have any requirement to disclose the data they generate in proof on top of, or like disclose some part, or like whatever, whatever, or let's just disclose that they own this data, they've encrypted this data, things like this. But again, it's very experimental. All of this thing is very experimental. Maybe a weird answer, but uh, physics simulations, right? They're already so expensive without cryptography on top of them. If you want to know if, if your calculations are correct, you pretty much have to provide the data so that you can check them against the physical equations to know whether or not it's a reasonable solution. It may not be something that people think about, but I, I think we're a really long ways away before we can do um, uh, computation on untrusted machines via ZKPs for physics simulations. That's my background, so that's why I bring that one up. Extremely esoteric. I like it. <laughs> Come to us. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions for the panelists? Now's your chance. Yes, we have one in the back. Yeah, so basically I think uh, two of you guys mentioned the uh, audited, um, audited uh, libraries for the ZK proofs. Because uh, we are the auditors of uh, ZK Sync and uh, Manta Network. And I'm just curious about like what's the expectation, especially both for the protocols and the general audiences, because we, as, a, as an expert, we know that security report is like hard to understand for the general public. So I'm just wondering, uh, I'm just curious how you guys think about like how, like, because for like most of the ZK rollups and all of their, um, like even L3 and stuff, the major purpose is for the mass adoption, right? So in order for the, like the C-level customer to, Recognize, hey, this the thing is secure, and we don't need to take, uh, we don't need to worry about it. Uh, what's your uh, takeaway? Yep, thanks. You're mentioning you're mentioning exactly the case we had like three or like four years ago when we were on to developing like a cryptography suite of ours, yada yada. We kind of just like just like Manta folks are developing OpenZL right now. We were developing like our own thing for like, several years ago because there was literally nothing back then. And uh, we faced exactly the same issue. We were like, okay, I mean, there's a thing, it's built on top of this. I mean, here we go, guys, it brings you some value. And we, fa and we, and we faced, you know, such a phrase, something like, who the hell are you? I mean, who audited that? And go, go screw yourselves. I mean, it's like, go back when, go back when this is audited and like widespreadly used. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So I guess it just takes time. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, just, just taking time, that's it. People want audits so that they can say it wasn't their fault. That's why you want to audit, right? Yes, correct. Let's, let's not kid ourselves here. This is why people want audits. It's ask over. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's exactly what it is. It's the McKinsey for code. Yeah. You can say, 
like it's you know, their fault. Every there's been a couple of instance, instances I can recall where you know the audit's been done by very very credible companies, um, and still there's problems. I think the only, there's, there's no real substitute for eyes on the code over years, and that's why things like Linux, as an example, uh, are just bulletproof more or less. It still has problems, but like there's no substitute for that. You know, I just I think audits are nice. Of course, it's like good to do your DD before you go into production with something, but they're to my mind they have a certain level of value, uh, and after that it's really just ass covering. Okay, do, I think we have time for one more question. If anybody has one more question, otherwise we're gonna wrap up. So, any other questions? Nope. Okay, great, thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, and for our final talk, we've uh, brought back the good old ZK Porter to moderate a panel discussion on what it takes to build a blockchain at scale. So, go for it, thanks. All right, welcome everyone. I'm super excited for this talk because I have a lot of questions for these panelists. It's hard to keep up with all of the different teams, and so now is a great opportunity to learn about how blockchains scale. Uh, so we want to start with a quick round of introductions. Um, I'll let you introduce yourselves, Marissa. Sounds good. Tomas from Scroll. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, so at Scroll, we are building Ethereum's uh, scalability solution, layer two rollup for Ethereum. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Neil, founder of Eclipse, and Eclipse lets you build your own rollup. So the idea is that we want to let people customize the execution layer, whether that's the virtual machine, the gas token, mempool, all kinds of stuff there. You can pick your base layer or your data availability layer. That could be Celestia, EigenDA, Avail, many other options. Uh, and then you can build in additional customizations. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, my name's Ben. I'm an engineer at Starkware. We're a validity rollup based on Stark proofs, um, and we have our own DSL, but it's really a general purpose programming language in Cairo, um, and it allows provable, pro provable programs and uh, the provable state transition of, of StarkNet, the validity rollup. Hi, all. So I'm Gotham. I work with Consensus. Uh, so I work on a project called Linea. So Linea is an um, Ethereum so, uh, consensus solution to Ethereum scalability issue, a bit like Scroll. So it's basically putting uh, Ethereum virtual machine inside a snark and implementing the rollup pattern to verify that on the Ethereum network. Awesome. All right, so let's go a little more into technical detail about how your scaling approach sort of works. And so sort of like what's your unique strategy to scaling a little more just from the technical side? Like how close to Ethereum is it? And yeah, what's your approach? Sure. Do you want to go in order or uh, randomly? Whoever, whoever wants it, you can go first. <laughs> since, yeah. I st since I started, yeah. So look at Scroll, we took our principles are EVM compatibility, right? So we aspire to be as EVM compatible, as uh, Solidity, Ethereum compatible as we possibly can, which doesn't come cheaply. There are some drawbacks to that, um, specifically around uh, ZK proofs and, and how much, how expensive those are and uh, how long they take. Um, but we have basically decided that time is on our side, right? That we can throw hardware at it and solve the problem that way, but make it easier on you, the developers, you basically, if it runs on Ethereum, it should run on scroll. So that's that bytecode compatibility. So that's how we look at it. That's the choices we've made. Cool. Uh, OK, so I know that you framed the question as scaling solution. I guess my response is to challenge that a little bit. And the way that we frame ourselves is as a customizability solution. The reason for that is that historically, a lot of rollups or layer one blockchains have distinguished themselves based on throughput or latency or just standard technical metrics. And to us, these technical differentiators only matter insofar as they actually impact business differentiation. So the thinking is that as rollups and blockchain architecture gets more, more uh, scalable and more developed, eventually these rollups will have to differentiate along lines that resemble classic business differentiation. So I mean, we have some folks building Eclipse chains in the audience, such as Kent, who actually we used to work together at Citadel. Uh, but uh, he's building a real world assets chain. A real world, a world assets chain means that a lot of the participants on the chain need to be KYC and KYB. You might have some restrictions on what kinds of trans, uh, transactions are even allowed on the chain. Uh, and that has its trade-offs. That means that if you're trying to build Tornado Cash, you can't deploy it to a real-world asset chain. But the differentiator is that there are some real-world asset projects that can only be deployed to this chain. So that, that's the kinds of projects that we're interested in supporting. Uh, and as far as the technical differentiation, is that we actually don't do settlement on an L1. So we do sovereign settlement for these roll-ups. 
meaning that we pass fault proofs or validity proofs directly to light clients. The reason for doing that is that there might be some expensive system programs, or in Ethereum they call them pre-compiles, uh, that would be very expensive to settle on chain. But instead, we would do that uh, using, like, just by building the uh, like the verifier directly into the light client. Cool. Um, yeah. So a lot of people in the L2 space, it seems like, have have started with a problem statement. You know, how do we keep and maintain Solidity developers? Um, and that might be a good decision moving forward. That's not where we went. We kind of went from from the bottom up to say, um, how can we create a language that is as efficient as possible in Stark proofs? Um, so from that design primitive, we kind of worked up from Starks to Cairo to the Cairo VM um, to StarkNet. So. Um, and by doing that, we get to leverage those Stark proofs. And so I think compression was brought up in the last talk. And, and although it's not a perfect analog, I think it's a good idea to, to kind of visualize these things. So um, Stark proofs let us, um, you know, it's a compression ratio of about 100. You know, it depends on gas price at the time. But you can think if a, if a transaction costs on the, on the base layer 100,000 gas, um, if you're operating on this, this validity proof, this validity proof layer, it's about a 100x cheaper. Yeah, cool. Um, so I think just to, to take a step back, what is uh, the problem we are solving with, with rollups, right, is this resource scarcity on Ethereum. And one of the issues is the way that transaction ordering, transaction execution, transaction validation are all tightly coupled together. So rollup helped with that. And why we chose to do like, like scroll to have EVM compatibility and to, to be as possibly close to, to what exists today is because we are scaling something that exists. And I think it has a huge value in the future in the sense that uh, since we are implementing the same standard, the EVM, it's very easy for an application first to move from L1 to L2 because it has no additional cost to do that. But also for future applications, once several rollups implement the same standard, they can jump from one rollup to another rollup without any additional cost. And it will also greatly improve user experience to, um, to be able to jump between rollups and communicate between rollups. And so I think, yeah, we, we focus a lot on the technical part, but the non technical part of actually scaling massive adoption is also quite important, and I think uh, it, will, it will pay off as a choice, even if it's uh, not the most, uh, I would say, uh, easy task to do to put a EVM into a snark, I think it will, it will pay off. Yeah, it's pretty interesting that pretty much everyone answered about like some vision for the future, and then sort of worked back from there of like, what do we need to build? Uh, but there are probably gonna be some challenges along the way, so like, what's one of the challenges that your project faces towards like reaching this vision? Sure, I mean, I think um, those are like the typical challenges of, as you build anything, right? Security, scalability, decentralization, kind of like pick one or pick two. Um, so those are the challenges that we are facing on, on layer uh, twos, right? Um, we have some certain level of performance, but if we want to be more decentralized, we have to sacrifice some of the performance. And that's going to be very interesting to see kind of like how everyone goes and what do they pick. Um, you know, at, at Scroll, we are prioritizing that EVM equivalence. Then security is, is our uh, key principle, and then decentralization. Those are the three that we are, we are prioritizing. Um, but someone else might prioritize, you know, speed to market, right? Deploy now. We have to solve some problems before we can go to mainnet around those three components. But those are the priorities for us. Okay, uh, I guess uh, there's a couple. Well, from a technical perspective, I think decentralizing the sequencer is really interesting. Uh, sequencer fee markets and sequencers as a service is an area that we're actively building in. From like a BD or product perspective, I think it, I thought it was interesting what Gotham was saying about projects easily hopping between rollups. Because I, I wonder what's the use case for a DeFi protocol to do that, for example. Because they're going to suffer all this liquidity fragmentation. But I mean, they have all their liquidity on one chain. They can't just rip that liquidity and move it to another on behalf of their users. So I think identifying PMF and trying to understand why would a DeFi protocol actually be motivated to move to an L2 as opposed to using one of these other extremely cheap alt L1s where block space is abundant. Of course, they don't get the security of Ethereum, but is that like a sufficient motivator for a DeFi protocol to move to a rollup? I, I think that's still yet to be answered. Uh, yeah, you want. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly answer to that. So what I meant by jumping between L2s is not necessarily doing that on a daily basis, right? So you have the interop and way to talk between L2s, but just simply the fact that uh, you are not building a silo, right? You are not building a, a, a complete silo where um, applications that join your network are, you know, kind of forced to use a specific dev environment and so on. So when they actually need to change because I don't know, maybe your 
network is getting slower or they, they, they notice you know, some bad behavior on the network, the cost to changing to another network is actually not that huge compared to it. So that's what I meant. Um, yeah, so we've had some some pretty interesting challenges. Um, you know, productionizing these systems, all this tech is, you know, fairly new. Um, so Cairo itself actually started as a project that we needed internally. Um, Cairo is just a, a set of, of, of arithmetic um, constraints that, that form a Turing machine. Um, so re internally at Starkware, you know, people were still writing these circuits by hand, these, this, these constraints by hand. Um, and Cairo came out as a way to generalize that for, for in internal purposes. But, um, you know, it became pretty obvious that it was going to be helpful to other people to operate on top of our platform. Um, but we aren't language designers. So the first iteration of Cairo um, was very low level. You're still dealing with the, like, the, the scalar variable, uh, sorry, the, the scalar type was the word size of the VM, which is just kind of like there's no type system. Um, you know, so it was hard to develop. And so basically now, as of a couple weeks ago, we basically have the second iteration of the language. It looks and feels a lot like Rust. Um, but yeah, it was a challenge kind of coming out not as language designers with a, a language and saying, hey, come and use it. Does Cairo V1 officially out? It's out, yeah. Yeah, congrats. Yeah, uh, for Linea, I think uh, like all the projects, uh, the, the challenge is to, we all have what we call training wheels, right? To, to go on, on mainnet as fast as possible because else you will be in a tunnel and you will wait uh, five years to see something that all the engineers are happy about. So yeah, the challenge is to remove these training wheels and, and, and to, to actually have a very good developer and user experience, I think. So the prover, I, I'm not too worried about prover <laughs> performance. Uh, we have time to produce proof for blocks, and, and it's okay, I mean, it will just delay a bit the finality, but uh, we have time to improve the proof performance, so that's not a, a main worry point for me. Cool. All right, next I want to ask more just your personal opinions in the space. You each have some pretty interesting backgrounds and unique perspectives on the whole ecosystem. Um, maybe we'll start from the other side. At the lowest level of the blockchain, all the way down at NARC, sort of what do you see that's kind of exciting that you're working on? Uh, yeah, so to put that in context, so uh, as a day job, I live quite down the stack. I developed a library called GNARC. Uh, so GNARC is a ZK SNARK library. It's open source. It enables you to write ZK SNARK circuits. Uh, so my interest is mostly high performance computing and ZK SNARK programmability. So um, technically, I really like to see, you know, the same way that you can integrate a signature or hash function into your program, that you can integrate a ZK SNARK the same way without all the hassle. Uh, so that's what really interesting to me is the last three years, you know, now we have uh, ZK Bridges, ZK Light Clients, ZK VM, ZK CPUs. We have a lot of interesting use cases really popping up with that. Um, so yeah, my, um, my lot of very, very good technical people all around the place. So yeah, just excited to see uh, more people using ZK stuff and GNARC in particular. <laughs> um, some of the stuff that's, that's come out of our ecosystem that I'm really interested in is account abstraction. Um, so we don't have, we're not, we don't have EOAs. Uh, every single account on StarkNet is a smart contract. Um, and some people in the community have done some really cool things. You can basically sign with your, with the trusted, uh, trusted element of your phone. You can do a signature, uh, a sign transaction with your face. Um, you know, some of the account abstraction stuff is really, really cool to me. Yeah, agreed on account abstraction. I don't know if you guys saw Opclave, but this is something it uses like the Apple hardware signing wallet or whatever. Uh, and you can use that to sign transactions. A lot of different privacy primitives, uh, which we, it's good to enable those on if you have your own roll-up, because you can build in those custom system programs or pre-compiles. So we're working with one project called BTQ, who's doing like post-quantum resistant transaction signatures, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, and it requires a custom execution layer. Another interesting project is uh, with one of these large cap PFP slash gaming companies building this kind of auction. It's like building a Dutch auction directly into the mempool. And the reason for doing that is there's some custody concerns if they actually do it on chain. So um, yeah, I think those customizations are interesting. Stuff that I thought would be really cool that uh, there wasn't really much demand for is like MEV re redistribution. Just given that at this point on everything but Ethereum, there just isn't that much MEV. So that didn't prove to be super valuable for DeFi protocols. <coughs> Yeah, so you ask like a personal uh, frustration. So I'm frustrated telling my mom that I don't work for Bitcoin, right? So <laughs> what basically means that I, I, I'm dying for the real world use cases. I mean, DeFi is really cool. I use it every day, but most people like outside of this room don't. Um, and so I'm dying for the real world use cases. And I became really excited about ZK technologies when I kind of connected it with around privacy and selective privacy and how that can enable um, 
basically enterprises to use public blockchains. Because I believe that enterprises using private blockchains, I'm like, well, just use a database. I don't quite, I'm, sh I'm sure there is a use case, but I don't, I don't quite get it. Getting them to use public blockchain makes sense to me, but they won't do it without privacy. And it's selective privacy, like they need their auditor. Deloitte has access to transactions, but you and I don't, right? We don't want to see when the new iPhone 15 is going to arrive at stores because we would you know, buy or sell Apple stock based on that, right? So it has to be private for enterprise. And I think ZK, I actually initially thought that ZK will deliver that, like we'll just have it on scroll. It's not quite there yet, but it's a good step in that direction. So that's, that's what I'm excited. Finally, I can tell my mom that I don't work for Bitcoin. <laughs> Just to like piggyback off that, is that why you call it like a validity rollup rather than a zk rollup? Because it's not actually like the zero knowledge property. That's exactly why. Yeah, it, it confuses people. They think it's a, a, a privacy related zk thing. We're not at we're, we're, we write the entire state transition to Ethereum L1. There's no privacy involved, so that's exactly what why. What do you use for, for data availability? Ethereum. Ethereum itself. Yeah, they call it data field. Sure. Correct. My mom thinks I work in NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> The, the eight pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Every time a project crashes, my mom thinks I'm losing my job. So. <laughs> what about the, 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 there is a version of the future where there's a winner take most event here. And I think that there's gonna be a competition to see who most closely aligns with Ethereum uh, to, you know, to try to be an enshrined roll up. And you know, I think Starkware, frankly, may have messed up out of the gate with that decision on uh, burning the scroll token. I'm curious, you know, that I have not heard in detail why that decision was made and I'm wondering if you think that that has put you on a divergent path from aligning with Ethereum? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I would say, I would kind of answer it in kind of an indirect fashion, which is that, I don't know if, you've, if you read the blog post about the token coming out or the tokenomics or, or the dif distribution, but one thing that I think is really interesting about what we're doing is, is we're basically incentivizing developers. And some of the things we're doing is like, um, automated incentivization. So, you know, if we have if we have the Stark token be the gas token, um, and we have a you know smart contract tracking tracking basically all the metadata of the, of the of the platform, we can say, hey, this smart contract was deployed and used the most by the community. We can automatically incentivize that that developer or the you know the wallet that deployed it. Um, not only that, but people that are coming in and building a crucial tooling, um, SDKs, libraries, clients, um, you know, these are things that we're not gonna develop that we want to incentivize the development of. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that the token facilitates on a community basis, um, not just gas. Do I think we messed up? No. <laughs> yeah, I tend to agree with that view, and that like the value that accrues to ETH should be based on the value that people are willing to pay for ETH DA or ETH settlement in the case of you're doing a smart contract rollup or something. But I, I don't think that it's right for like a rollup to choose its token because they want to ideologically align with ETH if that's not the technically superior decision. Or I, I think if you also have to incentivize like the prover market, to incentivize the Starkware team, uh, I, I think I mean, there's valid reasons to have a well, separate token. I mean, there's, there's ways around, you know, MEV ultimately is probably value attracted to But like I was saying, there's just not that much MEV, right? Like that's, there's just not that much MEV to justify that as being the, the source of revenue. Yeah, look, again, I, I'm, I have not fully understood the, the, the and when I get asked, I don't know, the, the, the design rationale that you start to wear. So a lot, most of the change is totally good, but you know, I've not really had this conversation trying to try to figure it out, really. You know, you guys seem very out of the gate. You immediately raise questions whether or not the software sees it, you know, we're holding out a possible alternative future for itself with an L1. And frankly, at Paris last year, you know, I think the founder said, they would not deploy to another L1, but I think you just did to Bitcoin, actually, right? No. Deploy to Bitcoin, no. Well, so no, Starkware did, I mean, there's, I saw some comments about it recently, there's a, there's a deployment of software on, on Bitcoin, right? 
so so StarkNet is a validity rollup on top of Ethereum. So like if, if we write our state to two different L1s, we have a, a source of truth issue, right? I understand that. I'm talking about the problem that Stark were about. We we have done some development around Starks and Bitcoin, but that has nothing to do with StarkNet. With all with all due respect, why do, let's continue with the conversation on stage and you guys can maybe talk about it off offline. Cool. Okay, well, I'll change to um, sort of why, why are we scaling? Why are we putting so much effort into all these scaling solutions? Uh, we've talked a little bit about like specific use cases that we'd like to see, but talk more about um, sort of, yeah, what, what does this enable once we build like this scale? Yeah, uh, I can go first. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, the thing is just simply not to price out normal users, right? Like everybody knows on Ethereum, when gas prices are high, um, you can pay 50 bucks for a transaction. But I, I for example, cannot use Ethereum in, in that instance, right? So scaling makes sense just simply to have cheap transaction. And, and I mean, mid-term, you know, just have a real DEX uh, that, you know, is non-custodial DEX, kind of a coin-based coin -based competitor on-chain on the layer two, uh, with privacy, please, <laughs> would, be, would be great. And I think uh, uh, this scaling solution enable that, like typically a linear or scroll, or any uh, ZKVM. Uh, because at layer two, everything is much cheaper. You can also add what Mina has, which is a recursion step. You can actually verify ZK proof on your layer two network, and you can enable privacy directly deploying or all the solutions we are talking about. I think, uh, you know, without scale, if you're talking about $100 of gas fees per transaction, you know, you, you're really limiting yourself to really financial applications. Um, most most transactions are going to need to make up the hundred dollars in gas that it costs to submit the transaction. So once you add scale, I mean, I'm just really excited, and we've seen some stuff come out of the community that just like non-financial applications that are just going to open up a Cambrian explosion of use cases. I, I I really look forward to like educational apps being run. Um, that's what brought me into the ecosystem originally. But an educational app that I have to pay a hundred dollars every single time I want to write something to the, to the chain doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I guess like the reason why I've always been skeptical of scale being the like unlock to a bunch of cool applications is that there's so much block space on Solana or Aptos or one of these other chains. And there are some cool apps that are built there, like clubs, a lot of physical infrastructure networks. But my point is that the block space isn't saturated. So if it were fully saturated, then that would imply that people seriously do need more scale to build whatever application they're thinking about. And that's why I'm so much more interested in like customizations that enable stuff like regulatory features like an RWA chain. We have folks that are fundraising for like $40 million power plants and putting their cash flows on chain now. Uh, folks who are getting like $100 million companies. I think it's a huge unlock for mass institutional adoption. So that's one thing. An another thing, and I think that this is a, like fair for scale, uh, like gaming, I think like fully on-chain gaming and new types of game mechanics that use crypto or blockchains more natively rather than just like putting a few NFTs on chain will be really important. And I think that th that's another unlock for high value retail adoption. Yeah, that's an interesting point that there is so much block space, but it's kind of like saying there is a lot of real estate, but then look at Manhattan, right? It, like, why is it so expensive there? And I think both of them are right, right? Like, some people don't want to build in Manhattan. They will build a warehouse somewhere else where the block space is cheap, but a lot of people want to be on Ethereum. For whatever reason, they want to be there because that's where the network effect is occurring. Um, and I think that scalability for Ethereum for established blockchains like Manhattan, Hong Kong, et cetera, is, is important. So that's how I think about it. I, I think that what we are building here is like that uh, broadband moment for, for dial-up internet, right? Like we've been there kind of like, you know, you've, you've had very low uh, speeds and the applications that we were able to build, the fact that pretty much everything we use today runs on the internet, like, I remember when email was moving to the internet, and I'm old enough to actually have been doubting it. I'm like, why would I want to go to a slow browser when this thing actually works in my uh, thick client on the PC? Well, clearly, that has been proven wrong, right? That slow browser became very fast, and there's lots of reasons to be in browser. So I think the same thing is going to happen here, where things we haven't imagined, the Ubers of, of you know, 2027, 28 haven't came to be yet, but they will because of the block space will give them in Manhattan. So it's like the engineering that enabled 100 stories as opposed to 10 stories. There is use for that, and there's also use for you know warehouses in the middle of nowhere. That's an awesome analogy. I love that, and the Manhattan thing. Let's build some cool cities. That's really good. 
All right, so next, bring it back a little more technical. How much scaling do we actually need? Is, like, is EKE VM going to be enough scaling? Do we need Solana VM? Are we need, going to need L3s on top of the L2s? So, like, concretely, technically, how much scaling do you think we need? I, I think it's unlimited. I think, you know, every time I, you know, have an ability to update my internet speed, upgrade it, I go for, like, the highest package, the most I can get, and it's never, never enough. Um, I think the more you give us, the more we'll take. You know, like if you look at the cloud data centers, AWS, GCP, uh, Azure, they are sold out. Like AI is using every piece of compute that I can give it, right? They have to throttle back so they can run other applications. I think it's going to be similar with block space. I, I know you, I mean, that's kind of like your business, more block space, right? So. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like the constraint is, yeah, exactly. Like the constraint to me is DA rather than execution. So when you mentioned different types of VMs, like parallelism in the VM, like what the Solana C level virtual machine has, or local fee markets, I think Fuel as a VM is really interesting. But I feel like that's not actually the scaling bottleneck. It ultimately comes down to where are we going to put these blocks of data? And that's what folks like Celestia, Eigen DA, and Ethereum with Donk Sharding are all going to enable. And I think that that's going to be like a huge unlock for deploying like a thousand rollups or something like that. I'm kind of up two minds about it. I, I agree that you know as much as we can get, we'll take. Um, but I do also think it's kind of an application specific question. Um, you know, each app is going to have its own scalability needs, and and you know if it doesn't actually require any type of composability at that at a you know each layer, layer one or layer two, then maybe you're looking at like a layer three uh, or an app chain specific paradigm. I mean, they said everything, so <laughs> nothing to add on that. Yeah. Nice. All right, well, we can probably switch over to audience questions soon, but I want to give all the panelists a chance to say anything that I haven't asked about or anything else you want to say. Mm -hmm. Let's <laughs> well, with the audience. All right, that makes me feel better. Um, audience, yes. Yeah, so everybody here talks about decentralization. I'm just curious, like, have people started open sourcing? their information so that decentralized provers can actually start acting and when do you think that's going to happen because otherwise it's just a centralized protocol running centralized languages on centralized computing power but saying oh no we're gonna decentralize so right yeah. now is this a 2023 thing 2024 thing or 2020 sometime in the future after i cash out my tokens thing yeah, so for Scroll is now. It's the 2023 thing. We think of decentralization as really feeding also the security. It, I think it was the previous panel right here that somebody said, look, uh, if the code's open, like Linux, right, there are so many eyes on it. That's what we think. So our prover is decentralized. We've been building in a decentralized open source. I guess when you said decentralization, you also kind of meant open source. So we've been building an open source way from the beginning. It's, again, one of the decisions that you don't know if it's right or wrong, but that's the one, the path we've chosen. It has given us security. We are using uh, primitives from ZK Cash, so we are also using other open source technology that's, you know, in blockchain years proven. Um, so for us, it's, it's what we are doing today. We intend to, I, I don't want to, I can't announce, I don't know what future holds, but we intend to launch with the decentralized provers and decentralized sequencers. Um, so, so that would be a big step for the, for the space. Yeah, I agreed on that. And it's kind of two separate questions, because you can be open source, like Optimism or something, and still be centralized. Optimism centralized one sequencer per chain, uh, like OP stack. And yeah, that, I think you can expect it somewhere around the beginning of next year to have decentralized sequencers. Prover markets maybe, maybe a little longer, but uh, I, yeah, I mean, you guys could speak to more, more on your progress on that. We're, we're a similar time frame. Um, as far as open source, the last piece of our stack that's not fully open source is, is the prover. Um, but we've announced that we are going to open source it, um, and that's the kind of the last domino. Um, so that's 2023. That'll be open sourced. Um, again, like Linux, eyes on the code. Um, we think that's really important. And then, yeah, decentralized, incent decentralized incentivized um, sequencers, provers, hopefully 2024. Yeah, similar boat. I mean, the lower level of the stack, which is NARC, is already open source, and the rest is going to be open source for sure with permissive license. Uh, for the for the decentralization world, which is used everywhere, I guess, uh, my take is I mean, uh, the decentralization of the sequencer will come first. The prover, technically, because you already benefit of the ZK aspect of things, where you know you can verify your proof and you trust that the proof is correct, is less important, right? You need it to be probably not as permission, but we still can have training wheels. Uh, but yeah, the decentralization of the sequencer is, 
uh, I think more important for, for scalability and, and getting trust of the ecosystem. More audience questions? Thank you. This has been a great panel. Um, ben, you mentioned something quite interesting about um, signing transactions with facial recognition. Um, what would you say the benefits and challenges are uh, with implementing that? Well, with implementing? Yeah. Um, the, the real technical in the weeds uh, is that it's using WebAuthn, which is like a pretty heavy, gnarly spec to get into. Um, and if you actually look at the on-chain data for the proof of concept that they submitted, um, you know, the signature field is normally just two large integers. In this case, since I had to uh, uh, adhere to that huge spec, it was essentially like an array of, I think, like 50 uh, integers. And so he basically had to go through and implement the custom logic to, to adhere to WebAuthn. So it was, a, it was kind of a technical implementation, but the cool part of, a, of account abstraction is that you can do that. You know, that's, that is literally just as valid of an account as any other account on StarkNet. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that's it for this panel. Thank you so much, Porter, and all of our awesome guests. You did a great job. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Great job, guys. We're going to have uh, Evan Shapiro come back up for some closing remarks in just a moment. And I did want to remind everybody that we'll have some time afterwards for networking. So please hang out with us a bit and meet some new people, continue the conversations we've started today. And thank you so much for attending. Hey everyone, so if thank you. One quick, sorry, and one quick reminder, if we could move the conversations outside until Evan's done speaking. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, so thank you so much for coming today. I think, you know, a lot of great panels, a lot of great things we learned about zero knowledge proofs and a lot of great participants. Thank you to everyone who came today and was part of making this event happen wouldn't happen without you, so thank you very much for being here. I think we're going to have around an hour now of networking and drinks. Um, I believe like just right outside there. So if you want to stick around for that, please do, and there'll be good people to chat about zero knowledge proofs with. So thanks again, everyone, for coming, and I'll see you at the networking.